Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Army Museum and welcome to the over 5,000 online. I just had a brief discussion uh, with the team who are running the audio visual. Uh, we have people listening from as far as Africa, the Asia Pacific, the Middle East and Europe. Uh, and then closer to home, we've got our units hopefully just finished their morning PT, sitting in combined sergeants and officers mess. And here in London, I can report in a cold, frosty morning, we've got 200 highly motivated people with their pens and notebooks ready uh, to take notes on followership. Uh, it's a delight to join you today from the National Army Museum. And on behalf of the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Patrick Sanders, I'd like to pay particular thanks to those of the National Army Museum, Justin Maschietsky, the Director, and the staff present here today, who've helped facilitate what I know will be an amazing conference and we keep returning every year and we're very grateful for it. Uh, by way of introduction, I am Director of Leadership and Commandant of the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. I command and lead with my brilliant leadership team, the Sandhurst Group, which just for your awareness, covers off the Officer Academy itself, Sandhurst, our Officer Training Corps across the universities of the United Kingdom, our General Staff Centre, which trains our colonels up to generals, and of course, the brilliant Centre for Army Leadership. By way of some context, for those less familiar with the Army and the Centre for Army Leadership, my role as Director of Leadership for the British Army is to direct and implement the development of all our leaders, that's all our people, and leadership, getting the Army to be better at continuously improving its leadership thinking, training, and practices. The Army exercises that development through the Centre for Army Leadership, the CAL, who have put this event on today. Collectively, the CAL and I are responsible for the leader and leadership development of the Army, all ranks throughout their entire career, and which encompasses the wider whole force too. So a warm welcome to our civil service colleagues. It's a great capability with significant opportunity for impact and betterment across the whole force. Additionally, we recognize we can add immense value in sharing our knowledge and experience on leadership for the nation. And we're delighted to be able to conduct wider public sector exchanges of ideas on leadership with some of those organizations represented in the room and online today. We are grateful for your engagement and your dialogue, and we greatly value learning from you because leadership is so cultural and context specific. So why do we study leadership so hard as an army? Well, quite simply, leadership is the heart of everything we do. And good leadership is the fundamental building blocks to success in barracks and on the battlefield. And of course, because it strengthens our fighting power, enabling our army to be better at its core purpose of fighting and winning wars on the land. Whilst the landscape of warfare and security challenges continues to evolve, and in an era of technological advancements, geopolitical shifts and complex threats, not least in Ukraine and the Middle East, it is crucial for the British Army to learn, adapt and innovate as the sentinel for military excellence, especially in leadership. With £35 billion pounds worth of investment over the next decade, we remain focused on being the best medium-sized army in the world. Now, I'd like to turn to some of the initiatives that we're doing uh, to make sure our leadership uh, remains preeminent. So what are we doing? So the CAL are increasingly pushing their outreach into the soldier space, as our soldier academies and training establishments modernize and update their leadership and leader development. The CAL's leader competency framework, which you'll hear about shortly, will increasingly feature in how we train our soldiers. Next year, we'll see the CAL, their doctrine and learning material, featuring more prominently in the design and training of all our courses, from soldiers up to generals. And you'll see much more briefings of our non-commissioned officers in particular in the art and skills of leadership itself. We're also supporting nation initiatives such as the new non-commissioned officer academy, which I'm sure the Army Sergeant Major will touch on lately, later, which will bring coherence to how we develop our soldiers throughout their whole career. For officers, we're now beginning to deliver a Sandhurst Group 2030 strategy, which will guide, guide us through these dynamic times and sustain our position as a premier military institution for leadership and military training. 
Our first milestone under Project Adair is the implementation of the Army's new regular commissioning course in May 2024, which will ensure our officers can consistently outthink and outmaneuver their opponents in the most challenging of environments, including a greater focus on combined arms maneuver. Our mission is to deliver combat ready leaders confident in our core purpose. Officer inflow continues to be excellently supported by the officer training corps who have recruited upwards of 1800 young men and women this autumn from across so many of our great UK colleges and universities. The General Staff Centre, which runs Colonel to General Officer Training, is piloting a longer Brigade Commander's Briefing that offers a course with more operational focus. And the Army Generalship Programme in January 2024 will build on the success of the Operational War Game in 23 and will further develop to harness the experience of the General Officers serving overseas, many of them in key NATO posts. The results of the One Star Commander's Assessment in its second year of delivery continues to provide essential evidence to guide the selection and development of the next generation of Brigade Commanders. We also recently commissioned a strategic renewal of the General Staff Centre that will adjust and update many aspects of what it means to be on the General Staff. I realise how lucky we are to have retained a residential centre and programme to continuously upskill our medium to senior ranking leaders in command, leadership and management, when so many other public bodies have closed theirs. There is a strong case for face-to-face -face learning, creativity, networking and fellowship that the centre delivers. We also maintain and have reinforced strong links with the development and execution of command as one of the three pillars alongside leadership and management that enable our army to function effectively. The CAL will publish a book on mission command operational experience to exemplify those links in spring next year. And having read the first draft of it, I think it'll be of real use to Lance Corporal and up to captains in the most critical level of leadership in a woman in the army. This has been a significant undertaking and I'm grateful to so many of you in the audience who've helped contribute experiences and essays to that book. So what progress have we made since last year? It's worthwhile taking me taking the time to update you on some of the progress in leadership development. So we've had the followership doctrine note, which has been published, and which has generated global reference and a huge amount of engagement, none more so than here today. The Army's new leader competency framework has been issued, spelling out for the first time the characters, traits, skills and competencies the Army demands of its leaders at every level. Army policy, it's not a bad word, on leader and leadership development is imminent, which will play a significant part in ensuring the Army's leadership strategy is suitably governed and resourced, and that the training and development of Army leaders is coherent across the whole organization. We are undertaking research into leadership values and behaviors, one outcome of which will be a refreshed Army Leadership Code in 2025. This year, the Army also launched the Army Plan for Organisational Culture, the plan for how the Army is going to continue to press on with improving its internal culture. It will have leadership-driven change at its core. I and the CAL team are at the centre of that plan, and those serving the Army will see leadership at the centre of the next teamwork all stop days in February next year. Now, on top of all of that, the CAL team hosts and attend a huge range of engagements with allies, both military and public sector, to ensure we are learning from the broadest spectrum of leadership experience and ideas, and to share the Army's latest thinking. These engagements have included some hugely useful time in the United States with our opposite numbers and with wider NATO allies and across the public sector in the United Kingdom, alongside the Ministry of Justice, the National Health Service, the police, and with sporting partners, such as the League Managers Association. We value all these relationships deeply, and they are at the forefront of the part of our mission that aims to deliver leaders not only for the army, but also for the nation. I suspect that most of you are familiar with the CAL's hugely successful podcast series, 
including the new Human Advantage podcast, which focuses on the more tactical aspects of army leadership, and which are notably now two of the most successful of their ilk in the world. If you hadn't had a chance to listen, then I commend them to you. And on the latter, the Human Advantage, the purpose of that really was to access our most junior leaders and make them part of that conversation. And I'm grateful that we're always looking for more people to record, so we'll come and find you. Our academic outreach is similarly ambitious and is the foundation for the work that we do, ensuring it remains cutting edge and credible under scrutiny. I'm grateful for the support of our wider academic network and especially the support of the Cal Research Fellows, many of whom are here today, and huge congratulations to the five newest fellows recently appointed to the team. I think they deserve a round of applause. Most recently, we also launched the Leadership Excellence Awards to identify, recognize, and highlight those leaders around the, uh, the world, sorry, around the army, who espouse the very best character, knowledge, and actions in leadership. And as you've heard, the DCGS... National Army Museum. The gallery is now open. <laughs> and on that note, DCGS will be presenting the prizes later. And uh, I hope you get to read the essays that I've written because there are some deeply impressive uh, and worthy award winners there. And so to our conference today, followership is the mainstay of our conference. It's a responsible topic for us to tackle. It may not naturally or instinctively fit into Army's nature and lexicon, where leadership as its overbearing companion seems to be so preeminent, but it must be made to feature. And I'll share with you some challenges at the end of this short address. Once you read and study the, the note, its value becomes clear. And I really do commend the Cal's Fellowship Doctrine Note and the learning materials that are available to support this conference. It's readable, it's digestive, and it's progressive. Its tenets are as applicable in peace and war, where peace is, of course, our time to become the best we can for war itself. And it directly supports the generation of greater fighting power. There'll be plenty of information and discussion today about it, but I'd like to highlight briefly some of the main themes of the Doctrine Note for those who haven't yet had the chance to read it. Followership is defined as the act of an individual or individuals willingly accepting the influence of others to achieve a shared outcome. Success in war demands the best from our people as individuals and as high-performing teams. Effective teamwork underpins our philosophy of mission command and requires leadership at all levels, inspiring and motivating others into action. But it also requires value-driven, proactive and highly professional followers. All leaders are themselves followers, and nearly all followers have the ability to lead. From private to general, we all have a responsibility to follow well and to deliver our mission. Leadership and followers are therefore symbiotic roles. They are inextricably linked. They not only coexist, but are mutually supporting and work together to achieve a shared goal driven by a shared purpose. And followership will add value and peace as we navigate the significant and exciting modernization under Future Soldier, and as we continue to build a winning army that is core to the nation's deterrence. And as you'll hear, there are skills and traits in followership as there are in leadership, which can be taught, practiced, and reflected upon, and which we must do more to develop in order to form winning teams in a winning army. As such, we have a fantastic array of experts today, both here in the National Army Museum, but also out there in your units to facilitate those discussions. But one final challenge, uh, if I may, which I was reflecting on in the car coming up, is followership new? From the trenches of the Somme, to crossing the beaches of Normandy, to patrolling the streets of Basra and the green zone of Helmand, follow me remains the most iconic call to action. So why are we rediscovering it? Why are we losing it? Is it individualism? Is it ego? Is it culture? Is it context? Or is it all of the above? Lots of stuff to discuss and debate, 
here today, but more importantly, out in your units as you analyze why followership is so important and why perhaps we need to regain uh, the essence of what it is. I'll finish by stating that the Cal and I look forward and welcome the engagement and the opportunity to learn today. We are continuing to confront the latest challenges and opportunities of modern leadership. I will just trail briefly over the next year. Our future work will look at exploring leader resilience in the 21st century, how to lead complex peacetime change, and a pacing challenge of leading in the artificial intelligence warfighting age, navigating the myriad of cultural and technological complexity. Heady stuff and more to follow over the coming year. Thank you again for coming along today. I wish you an excellent conference. Thank you to the units and those across the world who are listening. Please enjoy your day. And I now look forward to handing over to Ira. Thank you. My pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker today, Ira Shalef. I was well known in the followership community as a founder of the movement to elevate followership studies to their rightful place as the counterpart to leadership studies. His classic book, The Courageous Follower, is in its third edition and published in many languages. Building on that work, his award-winning book, Intelligent Disobedience, Doing Right When You Know What You Are Told to Do Is Wrong, has added a new dimension to our understanding of the follower role. He is Chair Emeritus of the Congressional Management Foundation in Washington, D.C., has served as a board member of the International Leadership Association and as a visiting leadership scholar at the Muller Institute, Cambridge University. His coming book, To Stop a Tyrant, scheduled for release in September next year, examines the role of courageous followers in disrupting an autocrat's consolidation of political power. Myra, you are very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to be building on the, on, on the remarks we just heard uh, which really lay out the outline of where, where we're going today. So five years ago today, I was invited to speak at Sandhurst on the subject of followership and intelligent disobedience. Well, speakers like myself um, really, rarely know what impact we've had. Today, I actually see the impact because the work of Cal uh, to take the ideas we discussed then and built on are really uh, coming home today. And I want to thank you for this terrific work that, that you've done with the subject. Okay, I'm going to attempt to do four things in the 20 minutes I've been allotted here. One is to make it okay to be a follower. I'll elaborate on that. Convey the attributes of an effective follower. Consider how to develop followership in the British Army culture. And lastly, how to apply leadership and followership practice in operational <laughs> space, both current and future. So that's a lot. Hold on to your seats. Here we go. All right. Um, first, I'm going to address the question that is kind of lurking in many minds here. Is it really okay to be a follower? Will that really help my career? Really? All right. Now, to make this point, I'm going to put on a hat. Can you see what the hat says? It says, I am a follower. Well, now, you, as we know, um, military headgear contains a lot of information about who we are, where we serve, what our relationship is to one another. Okay, so here I am um, putting on this uh, hat, which is declaring a, something about me. Now, imagine for a moment, this is a thought exercise. Imagine for a moment, that rather than this theme being effective followership, that the theme was more traditionally around effective leadership. Okay, that's what this conference is about. So there are about, you know, I'm told there are about 110 people in the room here today. And uh, let's say 109 of you are here to be better leaders. And I show up with this cap. And people are looking at me and going, what's he about? Is this some sort of a joke? You know, he, want, he wants to be a follower, and we're all here to be effective, more effective leaders. Okay, ha <laughs> good joke. But who's the joke on? Well, watch this. Without me, there are no leaders in the room. Why? Because what's the one thing a leader must have to lead? Someone must be following. So if, if I wasn't here following, then none of you who said you were leaders would be leaders. Do you see what I mean? So, so this um, 
picks up on the point that leadership isn't just important, it's inextricable. It's uh, followership is inextricable, it's indispensable to the leadership dynamic. Okay, so very good, all, all of that seems fine, um, but it might still seem odd that I was proud to be the follower. Doesn't that seem a, seem a bit odd? How many of you grew up wanting to be the best follower you could be? No, not really, right? Okay, so um, why does that seem odd? Well, I, I suggest it seems odd because it is sort of implying that that's my identity, that I want to be a follower, that I aspire to be a follower. But is that true? Well, let's test that out. Okay, let's say that I'm a senior NCO or mid-grade commissioned officer. Well, of course, I'm expected to take the orders that I receive and to follow them. But I'm also expected to give orders to those below me, right? So then I'm leading. Okay, but this is getting a bit complex then. Um, if I'm supposed to lead and to follow, neither one is my identity, do you see? So what are they? They are roles. Sometimes we play the leading role. Sometimes we play the following role. And it's really critical that we are aware of which role we're playing at any moment and that we play that role effectively. Okay, so given that, I'm going to take off my cap <laughs> because that's only one of the roles. And I have to be able to play both of these roles well. How do I do that? Well, uh, can I have the slide, please? Yeah, here we go. Um, we're going to use the leader-follower relationship model from the followership doctrine note, which is really, um, they've done a really good job with this. I want you to notice a few things about this. Let's start with the very center where it says shared purpose. Now you'll notice that followers are not orbiting leaders. Let that sink in. They're not orbiting the leader. The leader and the follower are orbiting the shared purpose, or we might, or, or we might say the mission. Okay, that's really the central binding force that, that holds us together. It's the mission, the purpose is more fundamental than hierarchy or rank. Okay, now, with that in mind, go to the next circle outside there. It says shared values. It's a little bit darker shade of green there. If you see what I mean? Now, all of our, our work is being done within some set of hopefully well-shared values. The more shared the values are between those leading and those following, the better the alignment is going to be in the quality of our leadership and, and our followership. Lastly, look at the very outer circle, which is the context, the changing context. Changing is the right word there. Context is always in a state of flux. And we may be leading in all different kinds or following in all different kinds of contexts. It can be a training context, a logistics context, an operations context, a peacetime context, or a war footing context. And all of those contexts are going to have a different, um, different uh, sort of set of requirements for how we do our leading and following. following. So now, in the VUCA battle space, this is particularly true. So leaders may have to order very rapid shifts of tactics in order to uh, achieve the commander's intent based on the rapidly changing context. Or followers may need to compensate for a leader's blindsidedness in a particular context, or even for a fallen leader. <clears throat> so now, in that context, the follower may need to become the leader. Again, this is roles, shifting roles, knowing which role we need to play. All right. Now, most of the orders that we're getting, even in the heat of battle, of course, should be followed rapidly and effectively, but sometimes not. Why not? Well, remember that we're always pursuing the mission within a set of values. 
And if that particular order unintentionally is violating a core value, it's possible that we may not need, we should not follow it. I'm going to give you an example from the first edition of my book, The Courageous Follower. This occurred during the first Iraq war when a soldier was ordered to fire a targeted position. And in his very good battle awareness, he recognized that that position was occupied by elements of our own troops. So he took personal accountability and did not execute the order. All right. Well, after, after the action, uh, a hearing was held, as it should be. You know, was disciplinary action required here that he did not follow the order? The hearing officers found that, in fact, he was right. And by refusing the order, he had saved lives from friendly fire. Now, here's where I think it gets really interesting. Not only didn't they discipline the soldier, but they rewarded him with a medal a medal for the courage to do the right thing in, uh, in a VUCA environment, if you, if you see what I mean. And that took a lot of courage and personal accountability. So I dedicate did that book, the first edition, not only to the soldier, but to the officers who saw that validating correct followership was what we needed if that's what we wanted to have within our uh, armed services. So um, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, we, we, you know, we give our leaders complete wholehearted uh, support that they deserve. But once in a while, we have to be prepared to give them candid feedback or even <laughs> intelligent disobedience if they are blindsided. And in fact, when we do that, not only are we serving the mission well, we're serving our leader well. We don't let them make a bad mistake. Do you, do you see what I mean? Now, this, this is difficult stuff to integrate you know, in, into uh, our general way of being. So um, I, I think you'll agree, that, yes, it took courage. It was an individual act of accountability to not, not execute the order in, in the face of uh, what would have been friendly fire. But that was an individual act. And now the question is, how do we develop a culture of courageous followership where we have high support for our leadership, but also high candor and, if necessary, intelligent disobedience? How do we do this? Well, let me assure you, it is insufficient for the commanding officer to simply say, anyone can come in, tell me anything. If you disagree with something I'm doing, just come in and let me know. Most of you have heard this at some point in your career. A few of you will walk in the door kind of brazenly, but most of us will hesitate to do so, even if we're given you know, that supposedly uh, invitation. Why will we hesitate? Well, think about this. The whole society, from the days of our very, very early upbringing, are teaching us the need to follow rules and obey orders. This isn't wrong. This is necessary you know, to have an orderly society, but it's done so well that it becomes almost an inviolable baseline. This is our, you know, at the family dinner table, at, uh, in, in our primary schools, in our sports teams, in our first jobs, and certainly within the armed forces uh, in, in, uh, induction. We learn to obey, we learn to obey. So now you add on to top of that, that many of us come from different cultural backgrounds. And some of those cultural backgrounds, the idea of speaking up to, let alone speaking back to um, an elder person is unthinkable. So all of this is coming in in the psyche of the units that you are commanding. Do you see what I mean? So what do we do in order to actually achieve that fluidity where most of the time we obey, but when it's not the right thing to do that we speak up instead? Well, let me give you the strongest real world example we have of this. And it comes from the aviation industry. <clears throat> in the 1970s, there was a rash of fatal airline crashes. The uh, 
flying public were becoming very nervous. The industry had to do something to reassure the public. Well, they did a close investigation of what was going on. They found it was rarely mechanical error, and instead it was mostly communication error between the crew and the captain. And mostly that error was the captain, who was usually the flying pilot, outranked everyone else. And there was a great reluctance to speak up assertively enough when it was seen that the captain was making a serious error. So, in order to remedy that, I mean, this this was painful stuff. I've listened to the black box recordings, and you can hear the the crew either not speaking up or being very very deferential and saying, you know, oh, do, do, maybe, maybe we ought to make an adjustment instead of saying, Captain, you need to adjust now. And seconds later, everyone dies. I mean, that's how serious these errors were. Okay, so to remedy this. The airlines instituted a program which was originally called cockpit resource management. It was then extended to the entire flight crew. And flight crews were put through simulations in which an error was occurring. And they were trained to speak up early enough and to speak up assertively enough to correct the pilot. And this so improved safety throughout the aviation industry then it also became the standard for military aviation as well. But note that in order to do this, we had to understand the deep social conditioning that had to be overcome through proper training and proper protocols. Okay, um, I, I want to suggest that I think there's another likely factor in why that training was so successful, and that was because lives were immediately at risk. But what about when lives aren't immediately at risk? You know, when, when we're dealing with planning and budgeting and, and uh, projects and things like that, where the consequence of a significant error won't be felt for several years, we still need to have a culture in which people are really understand that they not only can, but they're expected to speak up and speak up clearly enough that we can reconsider what we're doing before it becomes a dramatic, dramatic, but costly era. Okay, so that's the culture we're trying to create. And I just want to say that I'm going to add one other thing in here, um, which is grist for the mill. And all up to now, all I've been speaking about is human to human leading and following. But in the modern battlefield, we have human to machine leading and following going on. And often it's the machine that is now leading and we are trying to catch up and follow. But we have moral accountability for what is the AI uh, doing. Now, I suggest that this is going to take a whole serious new line of research here into how on the mixed battlefield does this play out in terms of leading and following and we're going to probably need a whole new vocabulary, a new language, and a new way of training people to correctly interact between leading and following roles, almost interspecies <laughs> between leaders and machines, between humans and machines. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I, I covered most of the points, didn't quite do the job I wanted in 20 minutes, but I've given my, been given my time uh, signal here. So I, I just want to end off that as a world-class military organization, in terms of the subject we're dealing with today, we can't assume that we already have a culture in which it is okay to be assertive in the follow role. We need to develop that culture as seriously as we do in any other aspect of military preparedness. It does take training, protocols, and then a sort of a reward system that doesn't wind up penalizing people inadvertently when they actually do what you're asking them to do. So this requires looking at personnel evaluations. Do we include um, criteria about effective fellowship in evaluating our personnel? And particularly in our officer promotion process, do we look at how the um, the officers at each grade are creating environments of effective 
followership? And do we take that into account before we issue promotions in, into even higher levels where they have greater um, impact on a large, large number of followers? So with this in mind, uh, I hope I've given you some food for thought here in the room and out uh, around the world where this exciting uh, our audience uh, is going to be peppering us with questions later on. And I look forward to dialogue with my fellow uh, presenters and with you in the audience here. And let's see what we can learn today and deepen our understanding of following within a military context. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next guest speaker is Colonel Professor Sir Jonathan Van Tam, MBE. He's a, a doctor, a public health specialist and expert on respiratory viruses and pandemics. He's currently Senior Strategy Advisor to the University of Nottingham School of Medicine, and his career has taken him to Public Health England, the World Health Organization, and the pharmaceutical and vaccine industries. Sir Jonathan was seconded to the Department of Health and Social Care, in 2017 as Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and he's probably best known to most of us for his leadership role during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly his effective communication from the Downing Street podium and for the delivery of vaccines to the UK. He received a knighthood in the 2022 New Year's on his list for services to public health and has recently been awarded the Royal Society's Attenborough Award for Outstanding Public Engagement in Science. He is a former Army Cadet Officer Currently, Honorary Colonel to 306 Hospital Support Regiment. Colonel Professor Sir Jonathan, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, General, sirs, ma'ams, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I feel quite unworthy uh, to be up here, uh, especially after such an erudite um, speaker to begin with, but I'm going to try and offer you some perspectives on organisational followership. And I do that really from a, um, a varied career across a whole different range of public health organisations that culminated in that rather unique experience in the last few years of um, looking after the UK during the SARS COV-2 pandemic. My only kind of formal qualification to kind of be anywhere near this podium is that um, actually uh, earlier this year I graduated with a postgraduate certificate in leadership. Uh, from the University of Highlands in Ireland at Inverness. I've been trying to get that since 2016. I'm possibly their worst ever student. I've suspended my studies many times, but I guess other things got in the way. Um, so let me just begin by putting my career journey up on the um, on the slide for you. Uh, the idea is not that you look at this and go, wow, he gets bored very quickly, but more um, to, to say that I've been to lots of different organisations, all with quite a, a strong public health focus, and um, experiencing those different styles of leadership has made me realise that actually amongst those organisations, there are ones that are really good examples of creating strong followership, and there are some that are not so good mm -hmm. as well. It's varied and it is just the way it is. And you will find that um, even within a single system such as the army, that there are different places where followership is easier to kind of galvanize. And one of the interesting things I found was actually at Roche, um, where instead of the usual kind of pharmaceutical bonus system based upon um, your performance, your bonus was based upon the performance of your boss. And so actually, um, in monetary terms, you were hardwired in to the performance of your superior and therefore hardwired in a way into a form of followership. Um, what have I learned from that kind of uh, very long and now coming to an end journey across the career space? Um, well, I've learned that leadership is almost pointless without followership. And um, really, followership is... Um, only the start of it, um, really what we're after is the creation of team. And wherever I go, what I'm looking for is the creation of team. And I'll explain what I mean by that later. Um, and leading by exertion of power is sometimes important. It is necessary in different systems, but it is always less effective than leading by consent, which is an essential part of that followership movement that we're looking for. And if you can create genuine followership, 
then it gives you that kind of moral consent to lead and moral consent from your followers to ask them to do difficult things at different at different times in the kind of life of the of the movement. And the other thing is that it genuinely creates a deep network of friends for life. And so there really is something in it about followership. And I see that in terms of people who I have followed to whom I have this debt of loyalty that will last until my last breath. And I see other people say to me um, that, um, you know, they may not have worked with me for 20 years, but they still remember X, Y, and Z. So I think there, there's a lot about this. The next thing to do is to put this slide up and prove to you that I have actually read the uh, Army Fellowship document. <laughs> I think it's actually a superb um, a document. And some of my University of Nottingham colleagues will um, tell you that I've already screenshotted uh, this particular diagram and sent it to them and said, actually, we need to be thinking about this a lot more. And um, the idea of the distribution of different types of followers very, very much resonates with me and resonates with what I have seen. And I'm going to put it to you as a kind of thesis um, that the distribution of follower styles in an organisation can be a barometer of kind of organisational health. Um, uh, and, you know, literally you can tell um, by the kind of quality of followership you're getting, what kind of an organisation you have. Now, <clears throat> having put that up and kind of made those remarks, I think there's a question that I can't answer and perhaps there isn't a single answer to, and that is what is the correct balance amongst the followership movement that you try to create of stars, of yes people, um, of sheep, and of cynics. And I put this little kind of red um, indicative um, diagram there, as I think my kind of personal kind of go-to space in terms of the kind of uh, distribution I'm looking for. So I'm not looking for 100% exemplary followers because I think that'd be rather tiring. Um, I do think I want some that are a bit, bit kind of lower key than that. And um, as, as Ira very eloquently said, I don't think it's right to put that horizontal red line so that the alienated followers, the cynics, the one who has, want to be disruptive at times, um, have no place in, in the game at all. I think it is important that they are there. Um, we could debate over coffee or whatever, um, quite how much should be there, but <clears throat> let's talk about that later. And I think the distribution of followership styles really does vary over time and by situation. And I've seen followership change with a change of leadership. Um, and I also reflect on some of my, I think I call them followers, best followers. They are also tomorrow's leaders. And that is really important. So I'm going to change gear now and um, talk about <clears throat> followership in the last three years. Um, particularly at the start of 2020, when we faced um, the world's um, largest public health crisis of a generation. And for me, kind of retrofitting what happened, um, I feel that followership was required in terms of three spaces. Um, number one, the close team. Number two, the government team. That is to say, outside of our little office, um, we have to support many different parts of government. And then, of course, Team UK, the wider population, and I will come to that too. Let me begin with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. Um, it's a very small team in peacetime, and even um, during our wartime, during the pandemic, it was only a team of 20 people um, serving the whole of government uh, for three years. Um, it is a statutory role, being the Chief Medical Officer, and you are statutorily independent of government, which means that you can speak up, you can challenge leadership, and you have the right to go directly to the public and say, I don't agree with something, but you're also a senior civil servant. You also work in this larger system, this larger machinery, and you're there to serve the machinery, you're there to serve the machinery of government. So it's a very difficult path to tread, and you can find yourself being a leader one moment and a necessary follower another moment. And um, of course, on top of that, we found ourselves under immense and sustained pressure. So for that little team, it was in 
intensely important that we created some sense of followership. And I th I'm sure we did that. Um, I think how we did it, we kind of convalesced on um, values, the importance of the mission that we we're facing, on courage that we as an office had always to do the right thing, about discipline, um, there was order and function in our office, the chief medical officer was the chief medical officer, there was a chain of command to be followed, but behind that, when the doors were closed, there was a respect, there was a partnership of equals, uh, very much openly expressed that everyone had the right to challenge, nobody was inferior to anybody else, and there was a kind of informality around the office that you would not see from us in the public space. Um, we focused on integrity and the fact that each one of us would lead by example and hold each other to account. So, you know, I've been warned by private secretaries before now um, to make sure I do things right because it's important for the team image that was, it was possible. They will definitely follow us, but they were there and ready to challenge me and say, don't do this, do that. <laughs> and we had extreme loyalty to each other. And we had a commitment to stay the course. And some of the private secretaries in the office should have moved on, uh, should have been promoted by now, perhaps twice, but they chose not to. They chose to stay with the team and finish the job. And that is very much to their credit. And I think it speaks to the kind of atmosphere that we created. Now, whilst I've been talking and spending a bit of time on that side, you've been thinking, why has he put a pair of shoes up on the slide? Well, um, uh, when I was in the office, at least um, once a week, there would be a point in time where um, all, everyone was walking around in socks, um, but there'd be nine pairs of shoes near my desk. And I'd have to brush it out to the polish, and I'd be sitting on the floor doing all the shoes for everybody. I quite like polishing shoes, but that's a separate issue. But actually, this was a deliberate act on my part um, to say to that team, we have interchangeable roles. We are a partnership of equals here. And I did it because I needed them to feel that um, they could speak to me and speak up to me and say what they thought. And I needed them to follow when it was really important. So yes, it was a deliberate act. Yes, I do enjoy cleaning shoes, but there was a kind of deep purpose to it. Um, we then move into that slightly more challenging domain of um, creating followership across government. Here we have lots of individual government departments with their own missions, some of them uh, concerned with trying to spend money, others concerned with trying not to spend money. And so um, you know, there are all sorts of kind of tensions in the room. And uh, what we strive to do was to create a kind of CMO office internal brand and then to project that outwards. And I think that probably gave us the best chance of other <laughs> departments feeling that we were a reliable place to go to, that they we were prepared to kind of follow our advice as much as possible. So separating that up into the kind of traditional commercial domains of, of, of brand, brand identity, we had a mission. Our mission was about protecting the public health, and that was our kind of unique proposition um, to our customers across all of the departments. Um, when you come to us, what you get is concerns about protecting public health. We had a kind of brand culture, which I've talked about on the previous slide, our internal values, um, and we tried to make our offering reflect that. And then we had tried to create a kind of brand personality um, where um, we, we kind of defined our audience, we engaged with our audience in a kind of consistent and same way. Whether we achieve that or not is for others to decide in terms of what our final external perception was as a CMO office. Now, um, we could get into the inquiry space, but we won't, and talk about all sorts of things that are intertwined with um, uh, whether people followed the scientific advice, whether they were true followers across government departments. But what I'd like to do instead is focus on that third domain of creating followership across the UK population. This is really a challenge of how you create followership uh, from a team that it's impossible to meet in person. 
And there are some aspects of that in terms of the army that it's impossible um, you know, for um, um, for Surgeon General to meet absolutely everybody uh, within the Defence Medical Services. It's just not possible. So <clears throat> from that perspective, um, how do you create followership to a kind of audience that you only see um, via the kind of channels of the media? And why is it important to do that? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. If you're in the middle of a period of um, intense social restrictions, um, you know, one of us has a party, uh, an illegal gathering that um, causes transmission. It doesn't matter. It really will change nothing at all in terms of the national epidemiology. But if 30 million followers also do that, then we've got a major problem. So actually, it was about mobilising the population as followers of what we were trying to achieve as a nation. And we only achieved it as a nation by these kind of micro actions of millions that had a big public health effect when put together. Now, in that space, um, I'm, I'm going to talk more about what I did to try and create followership. The, the first is empathy. And I really make no, um, uh, you know, I make, I'm not embarrassed about this slide up. Um, I'm not embarrassed about putting this slide up at all. I wanted people to understand that I did actually feel how they felt. Um, and that was important. And I think it galvanized um, their ability to follow um, what I then went on to say. Um, I tried to communicate effectively. I tried to talk in their language. And that was really important in terms of um, creating followership. I learned much of that talking to young soldiers as a newly commissioned captain that it is really important to talk their language, to answer the question, to be authentic. And it's okay to let a bit of yourself into the room and have a little bit of fun while you do it, um, because it creates a connection with followers and um, it makes them feel that they can relate to you and therefore they will stick with you. So really, um, that's all I really have time to say in the time allowed. Um, I'm going to leave you with some um, final observations. Um, my sense is that leadership and followership are underpinned by exactly the same values. Um, my sense is that we often have to be leaders and followers at the same time and with different audiences. And to have that adaptability and to understand when those two different roles are important is in itself crucial. And um, again, from the doctrine, curiously, counterintuitively, what it takes to be a good follower also looks like what it takes to be a good leader. And I do believe that. And I think if you want to create and self-create yourself as a good leader, you first got to reflect very deeply on what it is to be a good follower. And the final one, which um, may be slightly out, out of doctrine, slightly off piste, is to say that I think it is okay to create a leadership brand, if um, not for itself, but in order that others will engage and in, in, the, in the followership act that is that um, is needed. And therefore, sometimes, you know, within the bounds of conformity and decency, um, creating a unique kind of localised brand is, to my mind, nothing to be afraid of or to be ashamed about. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you there. Thank you. So Jonathan, thank you very much, amazing. Uh, we're gonna take a break now. If you'd be back in your seats, please, by 11.10, thank you. Uh, my name is Suzanne Braun. I'm a professor in leadership at Durham University Business School. Um, I'm delighted to chair and host this panel today. Over the past 15 years, I've worked with many leaders and followers and organizations on their professional and personal development journeys. Um, I'm also mother to Otto, who is almost one year now. Um, a journey that's probably taught me more about following and leading than much of the rest of my career to date. 
Um, I'm sure there are many parents, grandparents in the room today, and we will talk about multi-generational issues of followership and leadership. And I think it is fair to say that a lot of what we learn about these issues is rooted in our upbringing, um, our childhood. Um, the people, the role models, the teachers, the parents, the grandparents who we encounter. So these are fascinating questions. And I think with this panel, and I'm uh, sure you are as excited as I am, um, we will shed some light on what we can do. Leadership and followership are linked. They don't work without each other. In fact, when I meet somebody and they tell me they're a leader and I don't see anybody following them, that's when I get suspicious. <laughs> so when we talk about followership, there's a lot at stake. We've heard many interesting thoughts, ideas already this morning, but really what is on your mind when you think about followership? What does it take to follow in a world where almost everybody wants to be a leader? What does it mean to <clears throat> let somebody influence you, to be willing to trust them and to create the relationships that actually facilitate this kind of trust, this kind of dynamic? So lots to explore. Let me tell you a little bit about the dynamics of this panel. Um, firstly, I am delighted to welcome back Colonel Professor Sir Jonathan Van Tam. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome back Ira Chalef, our wonderful speakers of this morning. I am also delighted to welcome two new panel members who are going to be part of our discussion, um, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Langley Sharp and WO2 Adam Croucher. What we will do is first of all, hear from both our new panelists, their responses to these talks in the morning. Um, then I will open the discussion with a short quote uh, from the followership doctrine. And then the floor is open um, for you to ask questions, whether online or in the room we invite you to do so via Slido to make sure that everybody has equal opportunity to contribute to a vibrant discussion. So please, even if you are in the room, do use Slido to submit your questions. This panel is first and foremost for you. So take the opportunity and let us know what you think and what you feel are the questions that need answering. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Retired Langley Sharp, who is the former head of the Centre for Army Leadership. He is the author of the British Army's official account of leadership, The Habit of Excellence, distilling over three centuries of the Army's experience in the art, science and practice of leadership. As founder and director of the consultancy firm Frontier Leadership, Langley is now dedicated to sharing his experiences to help individuals, teams, and organizations perform at their best. Langley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, and a very good morning. Uh, I'd like to start with a uh, quote from the Fellowship Doctrine note, and it's the first paragraph echoing some of the words that General Zach brought out this morning. The British Army exists to fight and win wars on land. War is a collective endeavor. And su as success demands the best from our people, both as individuals and more importantly, as high performing teams. Effective teamwork underpins our philosophy of mission command. It requires leadership at all levels, inspiring and motivating others into action. It also requires values driven, proactive and professional followers, performing at their best to achieve the mission. All leaders are themselves followers and nearly all leaders, sorry, nearly all followers have the ability to lead. In private to general, we all have the responsibility to follow. Now, for me, this paragraph gets to the heart of what the British Army is all about. Clear purpose to fight and win wars on the land. Success, however defined, 
is ultimately delivered by its people and its people working as effective high performance teams. And for me, that uh, leader follower relationship model that Ira shared this morning, and he was very humble not to say that it was actually built on, on his own work, uh, really for me is a model of teamship. Leaders and followers working in partnership, you know, geared towards a shared purpose, shaped by those shared values and all within a given context. Now, the British Army, of course, has been explicitly developing leaders and leadership for over three and a half centuries. And it's no wonder that General Zach's predecessor, General Duncan Capps, would often say that leadership is the British Army's profession, uh, principal professional competency. And so for me, the publication of the Army Leadership Doctrine in 2016 was a landmark moment in the professionalization of the British Army, given how important leadership is. I would go on to say that the publication of the Public Doctrine note is the next stage of that professionalization, because the first time it brings into institutional consciousness what it means to follow effectively in pursuit of the mission. So this subject matter matters to this institution, this organization, arguably more so than ever before, given the perilous state of the world we live in and the threats that we face. But it's bigger than that because of course, none of this is unique to the British Army. Take away the core purpose and insert the core purpose of any other organization and the narrative remains the same. And as such, I'd like to give credit to the, uh, the Cal team for taking a position on this and offering a perspective that's not just important for the British Army, but organisations across the public and private sector, because this matters. And I would go as far as to suggest that the conscious understanding and proactive development of followership is necessary across society, because arguably, in, certainly in Western society, we're more empowered and have greater freedoms than perhaps ever before. But as Viktor Frankl once told us, with freedom comes responsibility. And for us to make the progress we need in the midst of so many significant global challenges, we need not just effective leaders, but proactive, courageous and responsible followers. Thank you very much, Manny. <laughs> May I now introduce uh, WO2 Adam Croucher. Regimental Quartermaster Sergeant, page Hugh Comfort, 3rd Battalion, the Parachute, who enlisted into the Parachute Regiment in 2001. Adam has gone on to serve 22 years within the Parachute Regiment. During his career, he has spent three years on six operational tours, and six years in instructor posts. He has also completed overseas training exercises in Kenya, Cyprus, Germany, Botswana, and the USA. His most notable deployments were Operation Herrick 8, Operation Telic 7, and Operation Pitting. Adam, the floor is yours. Right. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to be here today. And secondly, to be on this fantastic panel. And I think the words small fish, big pond spring to mind when I look at the panel to the right hand side of me. Uh, a little bit more in depth about me, really. I was in. I was coming to the end of my training when 9-11 happened. So I was at the end of my basic training. And from there, I basically got thrust in to at least a decade, a decade and a half of what most of us in this room know that the British Army conducted. That is kinetic operations spanning across the globe. Uh, my first tour was Operation Fingal, where I was a young private soldier. And that was one of the first ever tours of Afghanistan at the time. Uh, and I then concluded my Afghanistan campaign on Operation Pitting, where I was company sergeant major of A Company, 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. So in theory, I was one of the first into Afghanistan and one of the last out of Afghanistan. And with all the tours there in between, the Herricks and the, the Torrels, uh, I've span a quite a range of uh, the Afghanistan sphere. Uh, tied in with that, I've also been in Iraq on Operation Telic, and I've spent a bit of time in Northern Ireland on Operation Banner. Uh, if I span my mind back really to my operational days, where really I finished my last Operation Herrick tour as an NCO, uh, I would love of this doctrine though to have been a part of my life then. Uh, obviously, like using this doctrine note and using a bedrock of values and standards 
and entwining in that all the leadership doctrine that we're so used to nowadays, this kind of sums it up for me. And I'll use that from four angles. The first angle is to be technically and tactically sound in everything you do. And you do that by self-improvement <clears throat> and a little bit through the chain of command, pushing you in the right direction. But self-improvement and maintain them two things is a big one for me. Uh, the second one being, and a motto really from IBS Brecon, where I was an instructor, is seize the initiative. And especially you need to seize that initiative when formal orders are not there. And that is kind of a sphere that we operate in time and time again, especially in my unit and Langley's unit before, where we are on very high readiness. We're always the first in and we're always operating sometimes where there is no formal orders. Uh, thirdly, the leader and the follower tied into this doctrine, though, is a partnership. And with that partnership, it will extend beyond a superior and a subordinate. Yeah. And we'll go on to more with the fellow, fellow doctrine note later on. So <laughs> thank you all. And that's me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adam. In fact, we will now continue uh, the conversation. And I would like to kick, kick us off with a quote from the Army's Followership Doctrine. Foremost, followers take responsibility for themselves, for others, and for the task or shared outcome. Effective followers are also proactive, self-reliant, self-disciplined, and intelligent team players who consistently strive to support others in the pursuit of shared goals. They are trustworthy, courageous, and willing to offer responsible and constructive challenge, as well as being committed to their team and the organization, inspired by a shared sense of purpose and belonging. So with that in mind, clearly there are very high expectations for follower, followership in the army. Um, when you think about this, Adam, and linking into your experience, what would you say are the main challenges to fostering effective followership, especially thinking about a multi-generational organization like the Army? So I think, I suppose I want to start with to the two key areas there, which Susan brought out there, is the multi-generational and what followership is. So the multi-generational pieces I th suppose a lot of people in the audience, it might not be so for the people online, a lot of the people in the audience are at the extremities of these generational, the multi-generational that uh, Susan has just said. But I would suggest that the majority of people who serve in the mili military are between the ages of 20 and 30 year old. So that isn't so much of a generational gap for the... like the foundation, really, the majority of the British military. Uh, and what followership is. To me, it's broken down into five areas. Number one, being shared common values. Number two, having a mutual trust, especially between the leader and the follower. Number three, knowing when to <coughs> apply responsible and appropriate challenge. Number four, having a shared outcome in everything you do. And number five, and like I stated before, using values and standards as a bedrock while applying every bit of leadership and followership doctrine that we've got available to us today. Uh, we've come from 10 years, I think Langley mentioned before, the, the leadership note uh, was brought out in 2016. That's roughly 10 years we've been following up the, on the leadership role and we've arrived now with the help of Ira with this followership followership doctrine note. Uh, <coughs> in my early days we probably didn't have that type of direction and I think that's something that we've taken forward now especially as I've been transiting through a lot of instructional posts 
And I've seen how we employ, employ the leadership doctrine. And I'm sure they'll go on and continue it using the followership, followership doctrine note. Uh, in the roles of NCOs, I think, like it was stated before by someone, that followership is nothing new to us. We've been doing it for a while, but it's all ties up and all the loose ends are dotted in this doctrine note. As I was doing a bit of research before I come down, and I was thinking how I can aim this in an NCO forum, how I can pitch this mm -hmm. into how NCOs can use this doctrine note and how they can project themselves forward. And there were three people who stood out to me as I was doing a bit of research. Right, number one was Lance Bombardier Morrissey. He's from 32 Royal Artillery in the UAS department. He has literally and recently just flown a drone up to 55 kilometers the first time it's ever been done and it if you read through the follow it shop followership doctrine note everything he's jotted in there about how him being a member of a team and applying everything of the five things i listed before how he's gone on to project himself to do them things and become a valued member of that team uh the second one really is Corporal Natasha Day, how she has projected the voice of women and the network of women to a very high at defence level, probably even a strategic level. And now she's gone on to do that. And she's only a Lance Corporal, recently promoted to Corporal. And the third one is a person I know really well, served within my operation pitting. He's Lance Corporal Mason from the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. Uh, he's recently been selected for the World Championship Triathlon Squad. At the same time, he's been doing all that training and performing at that such high level. He's also been deploying on operations, deploying on overseas exercises and performing both military and his competitive sport in the highest of performances. Thank you so much. And um, in my mind, you have really contextualized this followership doctrine uh, note for us with, with great mo role models and with your own experience. Um, I would like to encourage uh, the audience here and also online again to submit your questions via uh, Slido to make sure that the discussion, uh, the conversation is relevant um, to you as well. May I uh, link over with the note on teams that you have brought up and Jonathan this is something that you have emphasized in your talk as well to form a close and trusting team what would you say are the key lessons that you can share and that maybe also link in with Adam's experience yes so I think I'd kind of take followership back even one level behind that and say what kind of matters to human beings and what matters to human beings more than being described as a leader or described as a follower is feeling that they belong and that they are important to whatever context they're in. And I think the creation of team um, does that. It, it essentially creates a kind of professional family, family unit. And with that comes a sense of belonging. And once you have established that sense of belonging, you've got that kind of safe space in which to explore what it means at times to be the leader of, of, of that belonging group, what it means to be a follower in that group, where actually there will be lots of different leadership and followership roles within um, within the entity and it isn't really any longer just about one leader it's often about different leaders and different followers for different purposes and um, it's about exploring what happens if somebody's not available um, whether somebody else can step up to the mark whether I for example in a critical meeting because I'm stuck at number 10 can send a private secretary uh, my trusted private secretary into that um, role for me on my behalf, whether he feels confident 
that I've given him the authority and the space um, as one of my followers to act up and take that position for me. And um, whether I've given him the tools so he feels confident to do that. Mm -hmm. And then, but always knowing that when, it, when we kind of regroup, he is again the follower, not, um, not the leader, but he had his moment when that was an important factor. And I think creating that belonging, that safe team space, and then exploring that mm -hmm. creates bonds between individuals um, that are just sometimes, you know, impenetrable and, uh, you know, stronger than life itself. Thank you so much. So you've really pointed us to the team, but also the dyadic relationship, the trusted individual who, you know, will stand up. Um, and that is, I think, a, a fantastic way to uh, link over, Ira, to some of the themes um, that you brought up. Are there examples that you could talk about where we see the creation of this building belongingness um, within the team or also the dyadic, the one-to-one -one relationship? How do we do that? Um, how do we get on this uh, uh, mission? Well, I, I love what uh, Jonathan brings into this conversation that we're talking largely about human beings, so I have brought up the machine issue, mm -hmm. and uh, what are the fundamental mm -hmm. needs of human beings, certainly to belong, certainly to feel we have a, a purpose that we are valued and we can contribute. And all of these are aspects of, of teams, and they play out in leading and following in the roles within uh, whatever the team's mission or purpose is. The, um, you know, we just, we have to keep building mindfulness into this because we, we know, you know, from research um, that teams can get so cohesive that they can then start to filter out other perspectives from other teams, mm -hmm. which then doesn't serve the, the mission well. Mm -hmm. So we always have to bring a certain amount of humility <laughs> into um, our role uh, while we bring pride into our unit and culture. We also have to keep that uh, re relation to the wider um, society of which we're a part and we're serving and continuously do our best to avoid a, an us and them mentality. Mm -hmm. Whether it's an us and them between the followers and leaders, you know, cynical and what have you, or between us and them and other parts of the society with whom we are bound to coordinate in order to achieve the necessary outcomes and the values that we espouse to. None of this is easy. It really does take um, consciousness, um, self-awareness, and um, team awareness. So it's a very exciting field, isn't it? As you know. It is. It is. I'm just going to raise a uh, human technology interaction question. Are there no questions coming through to me or are there actually no <laughs> questions on Slido? <laughs> Can I jump in to no fill the gaps? <laughs> I would need them on the tablet. <laughs> if I can just jump in while, while there's the technical issue out, um, because I just want to follow on uh, from this conversation about teamwork, because actually uh, it was something that came up when we were writing the, the doctrine note, and I went to brief the, the Forward Institute fellows, so some of our future senior leaders, and, and gaining feedback from them. And, and we talked about this leader follower relationship, and, and it boiled down to the team. We said, well, what is it? What's the whole thing together? You've got the leaders, you've got the what's the whole thing? I said, also, yeah, the, the agreement was it's about the team, which I think is, of course, to an organization like the British Army, very intuitive. And to General Zach's point earlier on, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily new. It's bringing it into the consciousness so we can mm -hmm. develop it and professionalize it. It's not actually anything new necessarily. You know, the core tenets have always been with us because we understand that element of, of, of the team, and particularly, you know, very pervasive through the regimental system, which you know, people will literally put their lives on the line for. Um, and to your point, Ira, and I can say that I think the Army's culture, particularly through the regimental system, is one of our greatest strengths and greatest weaknesses. Uh, greatest strengths because that sense of belonging and identity that again people will literally you know go to the extremes of it. But, but it can be a weakness when it creates that divide and that that them and us which is inevitable human nature and it's up to 
to us as leaders and followers to own the right mm. yeah. Are you still uh, waiting for the machine? Yes, and I. <laughs> I, I just want to surface something that I don't think has quite come out yet in relation to um, how I think followership is getting um, better articulated over time, but also more difficult. And that is the rise of populism as a political force and as a kind of movement in society. Um, there might be lots of good things that go with populism, but there are also some kind of counters um, that go with the idea that groups of individuals and individuals can say, I reject authority, I um, reject um, uh, sameness, um, I, I reject that the kind of, um, you know, the elected forces, as it were, represent me, and I have my, my own right to kind of go my own way. Now, I'm not remotely suggesting that that kind of creeps in to um, the kind of heart of um, many organisational cultures, including the military, but it is a context, and that is the world from which we now recruit into our organisations, and it is very different. And I think it's, um, I think you ignore it at your peril. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think I think this um, this this sense of empowerment and agency that that people now feel because of changes in society, you know. Yeah, on the one hand, it's a positive because it now enables people to have that agency to, to, to challenge and provide that handle, uh, as, as you've talked about, um, Ira. But it's also, I, I think that's why followership is so important more than ever now, because it's understanding what's good followership and what's not so good followership. And at the heart of that, again, you know, speaking to, the, speaking to Ira's work, it's all about responsibility. So how do you how do you own that, 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 that freedom and the agency that people now have to, to have a view, but wear that with responsibility? Yes. yes. And and one last thing um, I, I'd like to bring in in terms of your intergenerationality. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a um, era where anyone can access information. You know, go into YouTube and learn how to do anything. So in that sense, we're not as dependent on our elder leaders to show us how to do things. You see what I mean? So there's a greater sense of agency, which you demonstrate wonderfully, you know, um, throughout uh, the culture in which we're recruiting from. So then when, when we do entice and uh, successfully attract um, individuals from this culture, we have to have a culture that they also recognize where, you know, where they say, yes, uh, I understand, you know, that you bring a lot of experience and I can learn from you. I also know that I can bring in a lot of experience from my generation and can also help you understand the world in which we're operating. So, you know, this one, I very much appreciate your remarks in particular. Uh, you, uh, look, any company SARP majors that might be listening or are in the audience, I think we can relate to this from my level as operating in a company you see how different the lads are coming in from civilian street nowadays. You see how different they are. And it's us that are needed to change, not them. It's okay. us who are needed to adopt to their ways, bring out their strengths and make them into better people. And again, I keep pulling back to this, but it's all in there. Technology is cooperating with us now, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. And there are fantastic questions, so thank you. I will be able to raise a few. The first one being around incentivization and what do we do to actually help people to implement uh, some of these values that we're asking uh, for them to follow. So the question goes, challenge and innovation are not incentivized within annual reporting. Um, how can good followership become part of professional development in promotion? So are there ideas, ways of implementing this idea uh, of followership? I can probably comment on that. Um, because we did some work a few years ago about how we could take the Army Leadership Doctrine and better institutionalise that within the training and mm -hmm. education pipeline. There's lots of work done, but there was one really simple tactical example of we had some infantry colour sergeants working uh, with the team that came from Brecon. And they recognised that there was a gap in how they assessed the uh, the young leaders going through that programme. 
uh, on those courses because they were being assessed against command criteria, not necessarily the the, the leadership criteria that was uh, that was defined in the doctrine. So they came up with a mechanism for for doing that and getting feedback from both the director of staff and also the individuals. And I think that we're at a similar point now. Now we've got now we've codified what scholarship means to the British Army. We can then bring that into the training and education, and, and especially not just teach it, but actually assess people against it, so that it contributes to their reports, contributes contributes to their promotion, and, and, and so it goes on. Thinking about this uh, training angle, there's another question um, stating that good followers don't always make good leaders, um, and vice versa. So how can the army ensure uh, that people are able to develop both good leadership and both good followership at the same time? I suppose I kind of touched on it before when I was talking about it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. And with the partnership, you're also learning from, if you are talking about subordinate superior, you are learning from your superior, mm -hmm. which nine times out of 10 will be the leader. So as followership leads into leadership, they will naturally just progress be, to being good leaders. But again, as long as the team are operating as effectively as what they should be. Let me uh, throw in something here. We're in a process, um, this is a multi-year process of bringing the, these concepts into the culture. And it, it, it does take time, it does take um, institutionalizing the performance reviews, et cetera. But it doesn't, you don't have to wait for that. You see, within your own unit, you can create this atmosphere. Let, let me give you a very, very simple example of that. You know, if, if, I, if I'm the senior uh, uh, officer and I convene a meeting to discuss how to improve a process or how to correct a situation, and you've all been in hundreds of meetings like that, if I just, and, and there's, all different ranks sitting around the table. And if I just ask, start asking for ideas, I'm just gonna stay very quiet until Langley speaks. You see that, you know, the, the, there's that unspoken sort of culture. Now, if instead I, as the senior officer, start with Adam and say, Adam, why don't you start us off? Now, Adam, can his unvarnished views without worrying, are they going to contradict Langley's? if Langley had spoke first. So we can wind up minimizing the distortion that rank can produce in our, the candor of our communications within our own unit. So I think looking for simple ways like that can start the process from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And so time and change and development is of course of the essence here, but I'm also thinking of your experience, uh, Jonathan, during the pandemic where there was no time. So how did you accelerate good followership, um, effective followership under these circumstances? I mean, what happened during the pandemic happened kind of by accident. Uh, the team were the team. I think we were just very lucky in the uh, office of the chief medical officer that we had such a good team. But I just have to say, you know, the kind of the book I've never written um, will be called kind of leading by accident um, because that's just how it feels and most of what um <clears throat> most of the way i tried to kind of galvanize the juniors so that they felt they were following so they had this mission to follow and um, so they had this kind of freedom to follow in their own way most of that was instinctive and i'm just going to say it plain and straight most of it was what i've learned uh mixing in with and around the British Army. Um, so I think it's already there. Um, I think it's already there in the room. I think it just needs to be harnessed mm -hmm. in a slightly more formal, uh, more structured, frameworked way. But I think it's already kind of, you know, alive and, and with a, a strong beating heart in terms of how um, the Army does things. Mm -hmm. On the point about um, whether all followers become leaders, um, I slightly disagree with that question because I think all followers do become leaders in a small way, in some way. It's just a case of um, giving them enough freedom to work out where they will lead for you in the space. You know, it could it could be literally a small skill 
it could be a big thing, but you need to find out where they can lead and let them have that, let them have that moment. Um, and the other thing is that you need to create an environment where it's okay both to say, I want to be a follower and I don't actually aspire to um, ultimate leadership, but it's also okay to say very early on, I want to learn to follow with the eventual intention of becoming a leader. And it's for me to define as I kind of feel my way through this journey, where on that journey I want to stop. And so, you know, very personally for me, um, I had the opportunity to apply to be chief medical officer. I didn't apply. I didn't want to be that ultimate leader. I'm happier being a number two. I wanted to be a follower at that level. So from that perspective, we, we each have our kind of zone of comfort where we want to end that journey. But I think what you need to do is create that openness and that freedom of expression space so that you know each of your soldiers can actually talk through that and where they want to go, where they, how they feel now. Maybe they'll feel different in six months' time or six years' time, but kind of where they want to go on that journey. Mm -hmm. So within this personal development, personal aspirations and, and preferences, but also the wider structural context, there's a question um, around the Army Leadership Code. Uh, with it being refined in 2025, is there a need for a followership code um, to accompany uh, the theory that is there? Uh, I would say distinctly not, that this leaders and followers lead and followed by the same shared values. Mm -hmm. I think that would, would complicate things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as the as the doctor note says, as, as the, uh, the, the the model that was adapted from Myra's work suggests, you know, those shared values are, are, are critical and that at the heart of the army leadership doctrine is bringing those shared values to the line. So mm -hmm. um, perhaps a revision of those. I know there's been multiple review, reviews of that. Um, and that that's probably a, 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 a good thing. But, uh, but from my perspective, my experience, they stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. So they should both be part of or form part of and inform uh, the values. Thank you. Um, I would like to raise uh, one more question that we had around uh, perhaps the more toxic impact of the cynical um, <coughs> follower and uh, that's come up in this morning's presentations. Um, so is there a way to, to minimize the impact? Um, and are there ways to move them towards other forms of followership? And how would we do that um, based on the theory, but also based on your experience, Adam? So, and it's solely just based on my experience. I would kind of suggest you could definitely get someone from that cynic and move them across the exemplary leader, uh, uh, follower. And it is all about the personality of the people, of the person or the people that are in front of them. Mm -hmm. If they are, and I kind of put a point down here, yeah. we were talking about the last point about teams and like being a member of a team and having all them different types. I think it came up on when Jonathan gave his presentation, it came up and you had the uh, the survivors in the middle, and then it branched out to all the different ones. Essentially, most teams will have probably a th most of them followers within that team. And if you want to drag them across from a cynic over to the top right hand corner, they obviously need guidance from the more influential behavior styles. <laughs> That's good. Can I, I'd like to pick up on that. So um, uh, two things. First of all, we talk about courage in uh, the relationship between different ranks. Courage is also needed peer to peer. It is always easier to go along with the griping of your peers, right, than to stand up and say, hold on, fellows. You know, let, let's cut them a little slack. You know, they've got a, a tough mission. They don't have all the resources they need. You know, instead of grafting, how can we help? So that takes courage. And, you know, that is part of being a courageous follower. Mm -hmm. The other point I have found in, in sort of coaching the cynical type, what they really want 
is to be able to have their ideas at least listened to. Now, there's what happens is they tend to, at all meetings, they tend to be the one that says, yeah, we tried that before, that doesn't work, no, no, you know. And, and people get used to the idea that as soon as he opens his mouth, mm -hmm. he, it's gonna be negative. So we all roll our eyes and just sort of wait him out and then get on with the business. If you could coach this chap to instead say, look, sometimes when you are sitting in the meeting and you hear others uh, say something that you can get behind, speak up and say, that's a good idea. I think we should pursue that. Everyone else will fall off their chairs that you said something positive, first of all. Um, but you now start to put um, money back in the relationship bank so that when you do have a criticism, you're not just written off. So you can actually, as you say, move them towards the exemplary style. Suzanne, can I just um, add in there? Because I think when people look at that, that uh, leadership style, uh, model. We often think of ourselves, right? I know people who are cynics and sheep and and, and yes people, and they think of others and they think of themselves as far as yes, I've been a really good follower. But I think the best way of looking at that is where have you been in the other boxes and how have you moved from those boxes to, mm -hmm. to the top right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and whenever I've used that model, I, I always cite examples where I've been in all all of those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember a time when I was I was the cynic and I was openly cynical of, of the senior person in the room. And it was to, to your point, I were about courageous uh, uh, followership in front of my peers that held me to account back in the ops room. He said, you can't speak to that person like that. And uh, and it was great leash, but I think from him to be able to, to help hold me to account on that. Mm -hmm. So um, we've we've all got a responsibility. And I think the, the, the best way of moving ourselves is to understand how mm -hmm. moving others is to understand how we move ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that accountability um, to make sure that when we observe certain behaviours um, in ourselves and in others, uh, that we have the courage uh, to acknowledge them uh, and to speak up. Yeah, very interesting. So I think my, my kind of observation on cynicism is that usually at the heart of it is um, unhappiness of some sort mm -hmm. and the other thing that's usually at the heart of it is a lack of understanding mm -hmm. about mission value mission purpose mm -hmm. um, and they are the things that you, you need to kind of pull out and address if you can mm -hmm. and uh, take begin to take people on that journey but you can't do that while they're unhappy and you can't do that when they don't have a proper understanding of where you want to go to that can work and I suspect that um, Adam can make it work with most people. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, I think you've always got to be bear in mind that if it doesn't work and it's disrupting mm -hmm. the wider values of followership, then sometimes there are situations where it just isn't working mm -hmm. and you have to face that. Mm -hmm. That actually uh, brings us to an interesting question around the individual and the team and the authenticity, which uh, was mentioned also in your talk in the morning. Um, so the question here is, how do we reconcile effective followership with the cultural shift uh, towards being our authentic self um, and potentially to be treated as an individual? Do you see authenticity as... Um, Sort of a balance between individual and collective, or what? What does authenticity really mean? I mean, I don't think there's that tension for myself. I actually think you get better followership if you are all authentic and you are all um, uh, in the know about each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, in the know about who does what best, who follows best when who leads best in different circumstances. And um, you're just prepared to kind of bear yourself a bit. <clears throat> and um, if you do that as a leader, you allow others to do that um, as followers, and you take them into a place where they feel just that bit more comfortable being themselves, mm -hmm. but still being part of a coherent group. Mm -hmm. And I think um, kind of embracing that difference uh, and that individuality, um, whilst being very strong about what the mission is, um, can get you through that. So I don't really feel that tension that's mm -hmm. been built up in the question. No, I, I just, no, sorry, I don't. 
<laughs> and and in a way, what you're saying really reflects the idea of moving away from idealizing leaders um, as individuals or leadership as a process, which is what we're uh, talking about today. So in relation to that, um, there's a question from the audience whether there might still be a stigma around following. Um, is there one? Uh, if so, how do we work with that? And we were talking about this offline yesterday, and we were basically saying there is there's probably a stigma around leaders as well. And when you relate that to a stigma about followers, they're kind of in of it being oh, so he was a leader and this bloke did a very good job of being a role model for that person. And I I picture him as a follower. That's probably the stigma they're getting. That someone did a bad job of being a role model to a leader. He's classing that as a stigma around a follower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's probably a bit of lack of understanding. It's probably a bit of lack of knowledge. Yes. So I, I was going to say, I think this is the perennial problem with followership is, is the negative connotations that comes, comes with it. And, uh, and I think this is part of what this work, this conference, this conversation is all about. It's all about you know changing the narrative on what on what followership actually is. Um, I think it's one of the biggest barriers. Yeah, you know, um, so in, in, in my model of, of followership, as, as, as you know, um, I think that it's really important to have a balance between supporting the leader and being willing to be candid and challenging their assumptions or blind spots. But that really requires making sure, tending to the support factor, you have to keep the support for the leader there. Otherwise, when you start speaking up, you know, they're going to screen you out. Nobody wants to just be, you know, hear how they're not doing something quite right. Um, so what happens is that, again, this is a peer-to-peer -peer problem. We use some pretty, in the U.S. at least, we use some pretty foul language about people who are clearly supporting their leader. You know, we, you know, it's not very complimentary. And we say, well, he's just um, sucking up or this kind of a thing. I reject that language. I think that it's really important to say it is okay to be there for your leader and do predict what it is he or she needs and to be right there with it. That is not um, some kind of fawning or, or something like that. It is in service, again, to the to the mission. Even if the leader is, here, here's where I go with this. Um, we want the best leadership we can get. We, as followers, we need that. So if we just start to undermine the leader and they get more defensive and they sense, um, you know, they have to withdraw into sort of a personal encampment, we're getting the worst leadership from them. So instead, we do have it within our own power as followers to create an environment in which the leader feels more safe, more valued, more understood. And that's a very, very proactive and self-responsible stance. And I, I think that, you know, that is part of the followership culture that at least, um, you know, I'm advocating for. And I'll pick up on one of the points. I would just mentioned there about challenging assumptions and it's and it it is key to build on that followership to build on the team it I'll use an example what I was personally involved in on operation pitting uh we're out on the airfield holding back however many thousand local nationals we were holding back at the time uh and we were getting a call from the ops room to tell us to withdraw from the line uh and pull back to the AirPod. And we were like, that, that can't be the correct decision. That they, they must not know what's going on here. I'm unsure why they're telling us to do that. If we pull back, they'll be in the terminal in like figures two or three minutes. Uh, so I kind of took it upon myself to go back to the ops room, uh, <laughs> went and approached the CEO of Two Power at the time and said to him, Look, sir, I know you might have a lack of situational awareness up here with the cameras, with et cetera, et cetera. Do you mind escorting me back out to where we are? And so you can see the situation like in front of you. And it fair to him. He came with me. We went to the front line. He was like that. All right, good call, sir, Major. You made the right decision there. Stay here. Do X, Y, and Z. 
So without that, without what I just said about the challenging, the assumptions challenging mm -hmm. respectfully mm -hmm. the authority, mm -hmm. then we will never develop. Mm -hmm. Adam, that is classic. Mm -hmm. With your permission, I'm putting it in my next book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We are uh, coming close towards the, the end of the panel. There are a few more um, burning questions which we'll bring up here. Um, the, the first is around perceptions. And so, Adam, you linked in with that and you said, um, I have a perception of my leader, and I, I may also, to an extent, um, challenge uh, what they uh, suggest the orders they give. Um, here is a question around um, followers judging or evaluating the effectiveness of their leaders. So to what extent should subordinate feedback and these evaluations become um, mandatory or part of reports and part of leadership development? As in three three sixty type, or the follower evaluations. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know any leader that uh, has a serious intent to develop themselves mm -hmm. uh, will want to understand the perspective of those they lead. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for too long we've been in a position where we've been grading and marking and reporting on on uh, leaders at at all stages of, of leadership across the British Army, and I don't think that they've been taken into the account of, of, of those they lead. I, I know work has been ongoing to, to address that, but I, I think that's fundamental. You know, yeah. And that's and that's that's not just developing that individual, it's developing the collective capability. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if, if, you, if you are the leader that Langley is talking about, you are also an open book. You expect it to come back the other way. Like it, I, as, as a Sergeant Major, I wouldn't mind mm -hmm. being questioned yeah. by a private soldier. Yeah. If he has got a better idea mm -hmm. than the powers to be, mm -hmm. and we can roll forward his idea, then so be it. Mm -hmm. and, and informally, the best leaders encourage that. We do it. In, exactly. we, we do it anyway. We, mm -hmm. You know, we speak to our soldiers and our, our officers every day mm -hmm. to get feedback. But I think formalising it is not better. Yeah, I suspect Jonathan has something very yeah. interesting. Um, I completely agree with everything that's been said. But you have absolutely got to create the safe space mm -hmm. so that you can get really, really honest feedback. Mm -hmm. And you can, um, for those moments, um, discard rank and talk um, as equals and have that really open exchange. And only you as the leader can create that environment mm -hmm. where your followers feel utterly safe mm -hmm. in that moment, mm -hmm. saying what they think and why they think it. Of course, there's a duty of kind of courtesy and respect, as we've already talked about in your example. But there has to be that moment of absolute transparency and absolute uh, safety to say what needs to be said. And, and you will both grow from that. And um, followers will feel empowered to be followers if you give them that safe space. And you, you'll get more back in terms of your leadership style to improve. Um, so I agree, but I'm just kind of emphasising that safety space. Mm -hmm. So really what we're seeing is the formal element of evaluating, but also the informal of feedback and feeling like um, you are open to receiving um, comments from your followers. Um, you are open to, uh, and you create that safe space. That's uh, a very important point. So um, I think looking at the time, I'll uh, come with uh, come up with one more uh, question, um, which is around the change uh, that we talked about before, which is difficult to implement um, in a, a large, very large and diverse organization. Um, so how can all of these ideas really filter through and be implemented at the level of uh, soldiers? Would they, how would they experience um, this doctrine, what does it make it, well, real, um, tangible for them? What, what, What's necessary? I think it's about having the conversation. It, it starts here, it's already been said, small steps, how do you change your culture? You know, one step at a time. It's everyone's responsibility is having those conversations. It's it's the message that are, are listening to this now, is taking this away and, and, and having those frank conversations about what does this mean to us? What does this mean to the reality of our, our, our platoon troop? 
somebody or, or, or vote for them. That, that's how it happens. You, you can you can come out with all the policies and all the directives from above that, that, that you want to, but you've got to start the grassroots because that's where the live reality of the army life is, and the same in any organisation. Start in Sandhurst for the officers, start in Catterick for the infantry soldiers, start in training establishments, build it into packages that are run at training establishments. Before you know it, we will change our culture. Mm -hmm. And it's not extra work because we do this stuff anyway. We do it every day. It's just the, the nuance of the conversation around the, mm -hmm. the training we do every single day. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I will use this opportunity to uh, round up the panel discussion, the conversation. Um, as you said, I would like to thank all of the four uh, wonderful panelists. We've heard great ideas around um, safe spaces, around the belongingness around forming a team, uh, the trust and, and the values that we share. Um, and I'm sure all of you, um, and I'm very grateful uh, of, to hear of all of your experiences and to contextualize what some of the, the contents of the followership doctrine really mean. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to our audience online and in the room. Um, it has been a pleasure to host this panel. <laughs>
She's also a diversity and inclusion practitioner and lead for several individuals' care action plans. Staff Timpson has routinely proven her ability to develop herself and those around her over and above her significant routine workload. After her own tour in Estonia, she personally developed and prepared several other NCOs who were deploying after her, which was so positive it resulted in many of them receiving commendations. She supported her commander in building a team with a clear purpose and identity, routinely covered leading the team for weeks at a time, always performing to the highest standard. She's an exceptional soldier and thoroughly deserving of this leadership award. The winner of the senior category of the Leadership Excellence Awards, Staff Sergeant Claire Timpson, 4MI Battalion, Intelligence Corps. Next, we have the runner up for the junior category. Lance Corporal Kesketh exemplifies junior leadership on all levels. On recent operations in Kosovo, he identified new members of the platoon, were phased by some of the demands of the deployment, but quickly set about putting his team at ease by demonstrating an understanding of the oper operating environment far beyond his years would suggest. He often conducted mentoring and education of those more junior to him in time reserved for his own rest. He focused his efforts on maintaining morale and several soldiers who had previously submitted notices to terminate their service withdrew it due to Heskis' management and leadership. He has an innate ability to deliver across the spectrum of transactional and transformational leadership and his subordinates follow his personal example. He routinely steps up to cover more senior roles and fulfills them effortlessly, all whilst continuing to assist others within the platoon. He epitomizes servant leadership and has a technical proficiency beyond many others. He approaches this with humility that feeds his team's thirst for knowledge. He is utterly selfless and does everything in his power to train, motivate and develop his soldiers. He is extremely robust, fit and motivated to do well. He has proved to be a model junior NCO who fully enhances all components of fighting power in all that he does. The one up of the junior category of the Leadership Excellence Awards is Lance Corporal Kieran Hesketh of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers. And finally, the winner of the junior category. Lance Corporal Dickinson exemplifies the Army's values and standards. She has a naturally inspirational character that encourages those around her to do their best and sets an example that guarantees people follow her. She's loyal beyond measure and extremely humble. She volunteered to become a physical training instructor and organized a unit competition entirely in her own time, demonstrating her selfless commitment. She's confident, physically and mentally robust, always has a smile on her face. And forever, <laughs> goes above and beyond for anyone, anytime. She is without doubt an influential and positive person who thrives on challenge, but also uses her emotional intelligence to inspire others to work on their weaknesses. On operations, she stepped up to be a section commander who immediately earned the confidence of her team. She always sets an example in every way and encourages others to do the same whilst demanding the best of her people. She can also be a follower and understands when this is needed. She never fails to appreciate the broader context, is known for her natural ability to shine in any environment, and also works for the greater benefits of others, most often in her own time. A transformational leader, she applies reward and discipline with moral courage, but above all, Lance Corporal Dickinson is simply an outstanding soldier. The winner of the Leadership Excellence Awards Junior category is Lance Corporal Gemma Dickinson of the Household Cavalry Regiment. General, thank you. Winners and runners up, congratulations again. The real prize is that you get to get to the front of the queue for lunch. Uh, for the remainder, we will come back for 13 30 hours. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Linda Rissa, Senior Researcher at the Army Center Prime Leadership. And I'm here with Dr. Daniel Cowley from the NAM, 
to present the launch of the Kalnam Essay Prize 2024. Thank you very much, Linda. Yes, uh, we were you know, incredibly impressed last year at the range, quality, and, and sheer number of essays we received what was our inaugural competition. Uh, we got more than 100 entries, uh, and I think after the initial shock, but we had to read them all. We were all quite impressed by the fact that we had such you know, fantastically creative and interesting thinking on our theme of leadership and emotional intelligence. As a historian, I regularly encounter examples of leadership across a wide range of times and places. But simply, leadership, of course, is a vital component of our past and present. But that probably is somewhat talking, preaching to the converted, given that we are at the annual conference of the Centre for Army Leadership. Now, inevitably, when we turn our attention to army leaders throughout history, we are drawn to some of the most famous and highly esteemed figures, it might be Marlborough, Wellington, or Montgomery. But, of course, anyone can be an army leader across all levels of command and in all kinds of roles, from reservists to cadets to nurses and padres. It's for that reason I'm delighted to announce that the theme of our competition this year is unsung army leaders. Which leaders have been overlooked or forgotten? What was their contribution to leadership, whether in action or in the realm of ideas? What makes them stand out? Why have they been forgotten? And why should we remember them today? In answering these questions and more, we welcome essays that explore the history of unsung leaders in connection to Britain's armies, including the Indian Army and other land forces serving under the Crown. Authors are encouraged to look back through history and to consider any unsung army leader since the British Civil Wars. Now, with that said, I'll hand back over to Linda to give us some more details about the prize. Uh, thank you, Dan. You will find all the details on the CAL website, and you will also find a QR code on your path, as well as the electronic version of it, which will redirect you to our website where we, you will find all the details. There are two categories, like last year, a senior category for any author aged 22 or above, and it will entail the submission of a 3,000 word essay. We also have a junior category for authors between the age of 16 and 21. And I'm pleased to say that last year, this was a very popular category with some outstanding essays. And this requires the submission of a 2,000 word essay. The deadline is the 22nd of March, so there is still plenty of time to think about what to write and to do your research. And the winners will be invited to an award ceremony at the Royal Military Academy Sanders in June. And uh, this is everything. As I said, you will find all information on our website, and we look forward to reading the essay. Thank you. My great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, Olga Onuk. Olga is Professor in Comparative and Ukrainian Politics at the University of Manchester. Her work looks at the motivations driving citizens to vote, protest, and all migrate, and factors related to their media consumption, as well as identity formation and policy preferences. Her research regularly appears across leading media outlets, and her work has featured in the consultation of policymakers across the globe. She has authored Mapping Mass Mobilization and co-authored The Zelensky Effect, and is here to give us her thoughts on followership in the context of President Zelensky. Olga, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right, just making sure that when they click, that happens, perfect. So this image was supposed to be a slightly blurred image of a video screenshot. And it was supposed to bring you back to that moment when you did see perhaps Zelensky on your own very handheld screens or on your computers, and you might have that blurred uh, memory of him speaking. Fearless Ernest, Russian target number one, the man in the green t-shirt or green jumper, as may be the case here. Uh, as Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine unfolds in real time on screens worldwide, on your own screens, in your own hands, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky captures the global imagination like no one else. And just three years ago, or so it seems, Zelensky was still just a television star. His main qualifications, again, so it seemed, for the Ukrainian presidency, was having played one on television. The Kremlin saw him as a pushover, not a leader, perhaps a follower, but not in the way that you all understand that. Folks in London saw him as a pushover. Folks in Brussels, folks in DC. Many people got it wrong. 
Rarely has a politician so visibly surprised so many. The man Ukrainians, some affectionately, some not so much, calls Z, uh, has come to symbolize his nation's fierce resistance uh, to what many experts initially thought was a military juggernaut for Russia. Yet, this full on Ukrainian mobilization and Zelensky's leadership and potential to rally it should have not come as a surprise. The reason for its success is not that Zelensky has special leadership traits that set him apart from his country. Instead, what is making him extraordinary in war comes from his very ordinariness as a Ukrainian. As such, and this is the most important bit here, one, something that he thoroughly understood as a leader of his country, he inherited a tradition of dissent and fierce civic sense that was baked right into the country's civic identity. He is still a Ukrainian every person, albeit obviously a very special one in a way that very few others could be. So when we look at Zelensky's leadership traits, we note that there are some very important things going on here. First of all, he knows his strengths and his weaknesses. And that has been never the more on display since February 2022, when he certainly did not try to micromanage anything that was happening tactically with the war effort. He certainly relied on his generals, and the generals themselves did not then intervene in what he had a strength in, communicating efficiency efficiently to the general population. There's things that the army could have tried to ask the civilian population to do that they would not have done in such a efficacious and speedy manner that he did. He's also an incredible manager. He's a deal maker, uh, including within the military structures, and he cleans house when necessary. We know that most recently the Minister of Defense has been replaced in what was an incredibly smooth transition when it comes to political transition of its kind. And, and one, that military leaders were actually directly involved in, and the predecessor was involved in picking his own successor. Manager, I say once more, because most people do not understand that he was one of the most formidable political economic elite managers in Ukraine for decades, well, just about decades. He was not simply the a producer and actor. He was the general producer of the largest and most important television network in the country. The equivalent of being in charge of BBC or Sky, not News, Sky the Network. In the, in the US, it would be not Fox News, but Fox Network. These individuals are incredibly powerful. They're also well, very much embedded in a variety of political economic networks. So he's certainly a communicator in chief. He has this capacity to read an audience, but most importantly, simply not just reading the audience, he also accepts that audiences need to be open to the messaging themselves. And then what do you do to create an opening within an audience that is perhaps not open to you or susceptible to the messaging you are trying to get across? Uh, he's a knowledgeable also communicator, uh, specifically employing and selecting locations, themes and historical figures that have a very profound symbolic meaning to those who are listening to him. Now, certainly you might recall this was the case when Zelensky was in the United Kingdom. The choice of location and the, the historical figures that are mentioned are purposely designed to not only create a sense of togetherness of the audience listening, but also a sense of awe. And he is authentic. Uh, he does not hide who he is. Sometimes these may appear to be gaps, like with uh, the president of the United States, but in fact, they typically work for him. When someone is authentic and earnest in their communication and not hiding who they are, that carries across very well. In the case of Ukraine, that was specifically the fact that he was a Russian speaker from the Southeast. This is not something he apologized for. This is something he grunted. In fact, when he announced his presidency on the eve of uh, New Year's Eve uh, 2019, he approached the, well, it wasn't the stage, it was on television, but the camera, and he said, I'm Vladimir Zelensky. 
and then he moved to Ukraine. And that was the last time he actually presented himself using his Russian name. And above all, he's a humanist. And I think people who know him, people who watch him, people who pay attention, see that. That he has a true care and respect uh, about those who follow him specifically. But when it comes to his leadership in Ukraine, uh, most interesting, I think, is that he understood the lived experience of ordinary Ukrainians and what was their uniting value. He understood both the aspirations of the general population, but also their experiences of hardship, precisely because he came from very similar uh, beginnings. And he used that in his communication tactics. He embodied and purposefully uh, civic identity of the population because he was nurtured and made of it. Um, he united uh, the general population, specifically leading to his landslide victory initially in 2019, by highlighting common lived experiences collective memories from childhood and one's youth and key moments in contemporary history. These moments that would ensure that everyone who's 18 or over could recall, could remember, and perhaps has a very emotive reaction to hearing that. And he nurtured and promotes not only this important civic identity that has already been brewing in Ukraine for quite some time, but also a strong sense of civic duty and state attachment. So his messaging wasn't blind populism. It wasn't about me and the ordinary people versus the elite. Folks who talk about Zelensky as a populist really don't understand what populism means in political science uh, and are trying to downplay some of his really incredible tactical skills. Because he laid out a vision from, from very beginning when he was running for president and then throughout these last years, he laid out a vision where ordinary citizens in Ukraine could also be part of the problem. And in fact, he would repeatedly highlight that the responsibility and capacity to change things through one's own engagement is part of the duty of being a citizen in Ukraine. But none of this was new in wartime, right? I already alluded. And in fact, most of this wasn't even new for Zelensky as a president. Because these leadership traits, these capacity, this capacity to speak to audiences is not something you can learn overnight. And it's not just about delivering a line on a television show and therefore being able to stand in front of an audience and delivering a line. There has to come that understanding and authenticity to it. So how does Zelensky rally, help rally, help rally Ukrainians? He understood the median Ukrainian, the average Ukrainian, their experiences, their values, and their expectations, as I've already said. But most importantly, he understood fundamentally that language in Ukraine did not divide its population. A tactic that was actually used by other politicians to divide the country and try to gain votes. So a bad leader might do, in fact do that, right? What could be the potential polarizing aspect in the room and then get some friends on board? He did not do that. He actually said that the things that unite Ukrainians are much stronger than the things that divide them, which may be different linguistic practices. He understood that civic identity and state attachment trumped ethnolinguistic identity, that appealing to anything ethnolinguistic in nature, uh, nationalist in nature, was actually going to backfire and going to bring move some people away from him, even if it could move a certain core of people towards him. And he really thoroughly understood what is very specific about Ukraine is this history of people power and mass engagement. And that's not simply a uh, since 1991 phenomenon, there's a history of civilian engagement in Ukraine. And Ukrainians are known to be a protest nation. But most importantly, it wasn't uh, in this understanding of ordinary citizens engagement, it wasn't simply that Ukrainians can and will and have engaged. It's that repeatedly they had to get over hardships and disappointments after moments of euphoria when you think to major moments of mass mobilization in Ukrainian history in the, in the early 1990s, in the 2000s, in 2004, in 2014, these moments of euphoria were often followed by extreme disappointment and disaffection. And a good leader in case, in this case, Zelensky, understood that you can't pretend that that did not happen. Because if you do not acknowledge the hardships, then you will lose a portion of the audience immediately, in this case the civilian population. And he repeatedly stresses that it is citizen civic duty 
and commitment to democracy that drives their engagement. And he connected these things repeatedly in his speeches. Now, how do we know this? Because Henry Hill and I conducted a major content and discourse analysis of every single speech the man made by the time we were publishing our book and we continue to do this work now. We compared the discourse and content of his speeches online on social media, in videos, and in various public gatherings. We compared the language that he's using. These are the things he was stressing uh, throughout since 2022, uh, but then also before it. He did not become an interesting speaker. He did not start to play emphasis, place emphasis on responsibility and civic duty in 2022. If he did, there would be a portion of the civilian Ukrainian population that would not have believed him. And he's been saying this to us, to them, to my family and friends in Ukraine for years. For those who were open to his message prior to 2019, they were hearing this repeatedly in his political satire. These were not things new to his presidency. They were not new in 20, 2022. And this is why it really works. There's a long history. And if you want to, we did a content to discourse analysis of all his uh theatrical performances, songs, and the show as well. And we found the exact same themes were there. And just like folks missed his capacity to articulate civic duty and embody this civic identity in Ukraine, many also missed the shift that was happening in the Ukrainian population since he was elected. So if you're looking at this point in 2022, you're thinking, gosh, there's so many things changing in Ukraine. The civilian population is mobilizing and followership is pretty impressive. Uh, pretty impressively being forged. But what's been happening in Ukraine is that the, since he was elected, he was able to bring certain different people on board to key positions and key engagement. So here, I'm just giving you one example, which I think is the most interesting and most profound. When Just about when he was elected in April 2019, about 40% of the Ukrainian civilian population believed that democracy was the best system for the country. So we're talking after nearly 30 years of independence and democracy, only 40% of the Ukrainian population thought that democracy is good. Very quickly, in those first few years of his presidency, people start moving to supporting democracy. On the eve of all invasion, February 16th is the last day of our survey day on that Last number, the blue line is what you're looking at here. We're close to 60% of the civilian population in Ukraine believing that democracy is the best system. Why? Because a lot of other things happened in that interim period. Policy was going forward. Policy was in fact being delivered, even in the context of a pandemic. But he was repeatedly placing emphasis on the citizen's own responsibility and engagement. And all of a sudden, democracy was not something that was happening to them, but something that they were thoroughly engaged in. And that perhaps may be the first time a political leader said this. And we see this actually following on through to how leadership and followership works in Ukraine currently. And the fact that at this point, followers actually lead. So when you come to leadership structures in Ukraine, you obviously have to look at the national, regional, and local level. And at the national level, there is a very symbiotic relationship between Zelensky and his team and the, the top brass in the military. And whilst there might be some uh, disagreements at times, it, it would be impossible for them not to exist. We do know that there is this not stepping on each other's toes and coordinating actions and playing to strengths. And I think that's really interesting to watch unfold. At the local level, we actually have the development of local leaders that are emulating in substance and style, mayors and head of councils at the uh, uh, what Zelensky is doing. So this replication of style and substance throughout the different levels. Of course, ordinary citizens have a very positive uh, view of Zelensky. Many are enthusiastic. That's the very bottom there. Um, most uh, can't say anything bad about him and very few have anything negative to say. And they would vote for him. That's the, to this day, 74% of the population would vote for Zelensky. Um, but when you ask ordinary, uh, the, or, the, the civilian population, the ordinary citizens in Ukraine about different areas of competency, it's not like Ukrainian civilians are blind followers here. They acknowledge that General Zeluzhny is probably better suited 
for victory in war against Russia. But Zelensky is better suited for the reconstruction of the country thereafter. So that's really also something that the leaders in the country understand very well, that civilians, but also the rank and file in the army, understand that some folks are better at certain tasks and they're not dividing their support for these different leaders. So, but I said it's understood that followers lead, and this is where I'd like to just quickly go through. Ukrainians are a protest nation. To understand how followership and leadership works in Ukraine, you have to understand this, that a significant portion of the population have direct experience in organizing some kind of action, participating in the street protest, right? And that's the kind of engagement that you can't, you can't ever develop that in the civilian population. They have to have experience of that, which also makes them interesting, I think, soldiers thereafter. But protest is not like war, right? In protest, you may or may not have to follow certain leaders on the square. In war, you certainly do. Currently, we have 70% of the Ukrainian civilian population willing and ready to uh, protest against the government if necessary. And in fact, 80% of the civilian population is engaged in the war effort in some way, most by donating funds, some volunteering in the community, some engaging in protests, but certainly uh, about 4% in, um, uh, in the military and about 7% in the volunteer territorial self-defense. 80% of those engaged are continuously engaged in this action over the last nearly two years. So this is not a blimp in the, in the, in the radar. And they believe in the efficacy of their wartime engagement. They believe that it makes a difference. Uh, making sure that our slides are the same. Uh, and they are willing to continue this activity as long as it takes. And this is what uh, makes the general civilian population in Ukraine, but also the average soldier in Ukraine, uh, a bit of a secret weapon, as well as an Achilles heel. And I think the leadership in Ukraine very much understands that. Uh, they have to respect and also follow what ordinary civilians and perhaps the, 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 the very junior soldiers are saying and doing. Precisely because there is this emphasis on individual duty and self-responsibility, you cannot take that now away. You cannot build that up in a society and then say, no, hierarchical top-down is how we go in. So the Zelensky effect is two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, it is him being born of a certain ethos in society and then being very earnest about that presentation, as well as him being able then to bring certain constituencies on board to key positions. But when you're looking at Zelensky and what's happening currently in Ukraine, it's really a country of 44 million Zelenskys. And I don't say that flippantly um, because Zelensky is not only a leader who understands his followers, but a leader that follows them. And he does so in a variety of ways. I can go into details perhaps in the question and answer. Thank you so much. Olga, thank you. Uh, next up, we've got Professor Sam Green. Sam is a professor of Russian politics at King's College London and director for Democratic Resilience at the Center for European Policy Analysis. His research is on Russian and authoritarian politics and the politics of institutional breakdown. He is the author of Moscow in Movement, Power and Opposition in Putin's Russia, and co-author of Putin versus the People, The Perilous Politics of a Divided Russia. In addition to his academic work, Sam convenes the Eastern Europe and Central Asia Director of the Practitioner Training Program at the AFCDO and the Russian Area Studies Program for the US Foreign Service Institute. Prior to joining KCL in 2012 as founding director of the King's Russia Institute, Sam lived and worked for 13 years in Moscow, including at the New Economic School and the Carnegie Moscow Centre. Sam, you are very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and um, thank you, Oya, for for um, for that discussion on Zelensky. Um, I'm here to talk about Putin, and so it's um, almost tempting just to say exactly what you said, but 
<laughs> but the opposite. Um, it is an odd thing to talk about Putin and leadership or followership um, in this um, in this context. Um, this is not a purely academic context. It's meant to provide some kind of of um, useful lessons, and so the idea of useful lessons for um, this audience, for the British Army in particular, um, uh, coming from Putin is is a challenge to think about. It's also a challenge because we usually assume that compliance with Putin and followership, I suppose, as a, as a mode of compliance is driven by coercion and fear. And so in most certainly public discussions of Putin, we don't spend too much time talking about or even thinking that we have to worry about or wonder about where Putin gets his followership from and how he maintains and procures compliance. We tend to think that that's probably something he himself doesn't have to think about uh, too often than we have examples of people falling out of windows or airplanes falling out of skies to some, somehow make that point for us. Um, but I don't think it's as simple as that. So this is not a five minute presentation. Um, to preview the argument, um, Putin, I think, generates followership in three key ways. One is by meeting his followers where they are. Second, related to that, is by shortening the journey on which he asks his followers to go. And the third is by limiting the depth and the complexity of the compliance that he requires of his followers. So let me go through each of these in detail. I'm going to focus on procuring domestic compliance and domestic followership um, in the main, but I will talk towards the end about um, international followership uh, as well as obviously something that we are concerned about. So meeting followers where they are. Um, Putin is a dictator. Um, he's also a popular man. Um, those are the, actually the opening two sentences of, 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 of the, the, the second book that was, that was mentioned. Um, and it's a problematic juxtaposition because we tend to not to think about dictators as not having to have, not having to need popularity. Um, and in fact, that the role of being a dictator uh, almost precludes genuine popularity um, in uh, in some way. Uh, but I do think that that distorts our understanding of what's actually going on in Russian politics. Now, to be clear, Putin sits atop a massive apparatus of power. Right? So he controls a coercive apparatus, a coercive state, a police uh, state to a certain extent. He controls access to the ballot. He controls the way that elections are conducted and the votes are counted, more or less. He controls a propaganda apparatus, including the entirety of state television and much of the rest of the media ecosystem. He controls every party that's represented in parliament. He controls the judiciary. He controls uh, really everything that there is to control, including uh, increasing parts of the economy. Uh, Putin is also increasingly reliant on ideology, although this was not always the case. For most of Putin's first 10 years or so uh, in power, in fact, a little bit more than that, uh, he was guided by the belief that ideology is essentially an artificial construct. It's something that uh, self-interested politicians and other elites manufacture in order to create cleavages in society into which they can insert themselves uh, and um, make political hay out of those um, uh, divisions. He was forced essentially to take an ideological turn after he faced the first real concerted uh, protest movement in 2011 and 2012, the so-called Bolotnaya protests, motivated by um, a sense of, of antipathy towards, um, uh, towards authoritarianism, to Putin's own return uh, to the presidency after having spent four years as as prime minister and, and to the, the prospects that they gave to many Russians, particularly in Moscow and St. Petersburg and other large urban centers. He was forced by that movement to take a turn um, and in fact, to take a page from a lot of Western politics, to take wedge issues having to do with religion, with identity, with LGBTQ rights, with minority rights, with migration, to insert those into Russian politics as a way of marginalizing his political opposition. And it has only grown from there. So if we look at his speeches of February 2022, announcing his intentions uh, in the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, they are imbued with fear, with anger, with the sense of threat, with the sense of 
of peril, um, existential threat and peril. They're imbued with a deeply stylized vision uh, of the world, one that simplifies the choices uh, for his audience, that divides people neatly into categories of us and them, um, uh, that ascribes to people imperatives for action and reaction establishes an orthodoxy, rewards for adherence to those to that orthodoxy and penalties for heresy. Heretics he refers to as national traitors with obvious implications for what might happen to them if they allow themselves that freedom of thought and action. But if we look at those same speeches and at his speeches and addresses since the war, the full-scale war began, we see that they are purposefully eclectic as indeed is Russian propaganda more broadly. None of it can be distilled to a neat ideology that um, uh, uh, encapsulates a, a single and internally consistent and coherent worldview because it doesn't need to be. Right? The, ide the ideas that Putin presents to the Russian people are syncretic, not because Putin or his speechwriters have a messy mind and can't focus, but because they recognize that the idea space of Russian society is itself messy. That you have 140 million people, plus minus, with varying identities, varying senses of history, varying visions of the future, and that trying to reduce that to a single worldview is going to be difficult. You will lose people along the way. And so he gives everybody something to latch on to. Again, if you look at his speeches, you find references to history, uh, of, of, of the Tsarist Empire. You have references to pre-Tsarist history and the history of Christianity in Russia. Uh, you have references to World War II. You have references to the Cold War. You have references to the post-Cold War world. You have references to collective, collectivist and socialist ideology. You have references to capitalist and frankly fascist ideology. Putin doesn't care fundamentally, what people latch on to as long as they latch on to something that is in his message, as long as they pick something off of his menu. Putin has not discovered his ideology on a shelf and then tried to impose it on Russians. Every ideological plank that you find in his speeches was discovered within the edifice of Russian society itself through a process of experimentation and trial and error runs a massive research apparatus. People like Olga and I could only dream of having that kind of funding and those kinds of, of opportunities. Right? But um, uh, putting ideas out there, essentially throwing stuff at the wall of Russian society and seeing what sticks, uh, has allowed him to build his ideological appeal exclusively out of the materials that were available to him within Russian society. Again, meeting his followers where they are. Now, shortening the journey. Um, the, in, a, in a recent essay that the Russian sociologist actually still based in Russia, Alexei Levinson, one of the, the founders of the, of the Levada Center, uh, reminded me and anybody who read the essay of a, of a short story by the Soviet author of the early Soviet period, Mikhail Zoshinka, tells a story about a, a somewhat elderly gentleman I can only describe as a country bumpkin who comes from a small town to the big city. The big city is not named in search of his nephew. And he bounces around the big city looking for his nephew, finally gives up, gets on the tram to take him back to the train station in order to go back to his village. And there, lo and behold, is the nephew serving as the conductor and the ticket taker on the train. Right. And... Um, he's very overjoyed to find his nephew. His nephew is maybe somewhat less overjoyed to see his uncle, right? Uh, but says, I'll get to you in a moment. Let me just finish, um, you know, taking people's tickets. And oh, uncle, you should buy a ticket as well. The uncle protests that this is not what I should expect from my relationship with my nephew. I am your uncle. I've raised you since you were that big, right? I'm your, your, your father's brother. And uh, and so on, and he protests loudly to everybody uh, on uh, on the tram until, unable to sway his nephew, he finally dismounts and walks the rest of the way uh, to the train station. Uh, the story, uh, which is titled "Why It's Not a Good Idea to Have Relatives," um, <laughs> is meant to evoke in the early Soviet period sympathy for the nephew, right? Sympathy for the conductor who's just trying to do his job, who's trying to build this shining, organized, modern version of, of, of Russia, of the, of, of the Soviet Union, and, and what had become of the, 
what had come of the Russian uh, uh, Empire. Many readers, however, uh, will read that and have sympathy for the nephew, sorry, for the uncle, right, who has um, a, a traditional right to expect certain kinds of, of informal benefits uh, from happening to be the uncle of the tram conductor. It's not that he didn't have money in the, his pocket to buy the ticket, it's that he didn't feel like he should have had to spend it. Now, the reason I tell the story and the reason that Vincent brought it up is that Putin's message to his followers is that he recognizes that they, and in fact he himself, are on the side of the uncle, not the conductor. Putin's message to his followers is that they can stay the same. They can maintain their traditions and their traditional expectations. They can maintain their view of the world right where they are. He's protecting their lives from change. He demands nothing of them other than that they be themselves. Putin's ideology, unlike, say, Lenin or Stalin's ideology before him in Russian history, is not of the transformative variety. He is not trying to build a utopia or to restore an old one. In fact, he and Russian propaganda on his behalf speaks of the past really only as an allegory for the present. Hence, the war in Ukraine is meant to be a replay of World War II and the invasion somehow of Russia in 1812 by Napoleon and every other bad thing that has ever happened uh, to Russia. And he virtually never speaks of the future. He limits Russians' imaginations to the here and now. Now, those who don't like Putin's Russians' opposition rail against this tyranny of the overlasting present, but they are in a distinct minority. Putin succeeds in creating followers out of the majority by giving them a message that in this uncertain world and the world that has been uncertain for the last four or five decades of Russian life, and after all of the difficult transformations involved in that life, nothing in your life needs to change. Putin doesn't need his followers to do things they are not already doing or to believe things that they don't already believe. All he needs from them is to avoid doing and believing things that would change the nature of power in Russia. Now, embedded in this is a recognition by Putin of his own weaknesses and those of the system that he commands. The propaganda machine is powerful, as, of course, is the coercive apparatus, but they are limited. Taken together, they're much better at sowing doubt and at dissuading people from action than they are at engendering confidence in a policy line or an idea and encouraging people to act in service of that policy or that idea. Recognizing this, Putin does not ask people to go farther than he himself can carry them, and he does not ask them to go anywhere on their own steam. That leads to the third element, which is limiting the, the depth of the compliance that he requires. Now, Putin is on one level quite lucky with the society the, that he inherited after the fall of the Soviet Union and the difficulties of the 1990s under President Boris Yeltsin. Or rather, the Russian opposition is quite unlucky. I suppose mm -hmm. they're two sides of the same coin. Now, it is difficult to convince Russians that they are poorly governed by a corrupt, self-interested system of power, only because by and large, most Russians already believe that they are poorly governed by a corrupt, self-interested system of power. Indeed, it is difficult to find a Russian citizen who thinks that the country is well governed. And yet somehow this is good news for Putin. It's good news for Putin because there is very little in living Russian memory to suggest that a change of government could ever make anything better. And because Russians tend to see the state as inherently and inevitably predatory, many Russians' most fervent wish is simply to be left alone, to cope with whatever life brings them, however they see fit. And in this, Putin is only too happy to accommodate. So he's built a state that demands, historically, very little of the Russian citizen. They pay very little in taxes. 13% probably sounds very good to most people uh, in this room and, and on this um, uh, uh, audience. Uh, if you um, do come into contact with the state, you are still allowed more or less to bribe your way out of an interaction that you don't particularly uh, like. Um, the Russian phrase that the strictness of our laws is 
accompanied by the um, uh, unnecessariness of their implementation, sorry, I'm translating on the fly, um, remains, um, uh, remains very much uh, in place. Putin, again, though, recognizes the limitations that this law imposes. Despite our Western stereotypes uh, of, of Russia, Russians are not, generally speaking, passive. Um, I like to describe them as aggressively immobile. They cling to the places and the relationships and the networks and the coping mechanisms that have gotten them and their families through decades of dislocation. And they fiercely resist attempts at social, political, and economic reform that would upend those arrangements, even if they, even if those reforms would bring public goods like higher economic growth, more jobs, higher salaries, better education, more social mobility. Much of these aspects of Russian life remain unreformed over the 23 years or so that Putin has been in power. And we see this reflected again and again. The Russian government, dictatorial as it may be, but not necessarily foolish, attempted to impose the same sorts of restrictions that the government in the United Kingdom did when the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020. Um, unlike in the UK, where most of us dutifully stayed home with a couple of notable exceptions, um, most Russians did not. They found this as an unreasonable infringement on their uh, livelihoods. They went out and the Russian government decided not to try uh, to enforce these rules. We saw it latterly last autumn when the Russian government tried to mobilize 300,000 or so servicemen, sending many more hundreds of thousands of people to the border to escape military mobilization um, or uh, to their pocketbooks to get money to bribe their way out of service. And we can find many more examples if you want to discuss later. Now, when faced with these sorts of challenges, Russian citizens, again, seek to use their individualized coping mechanisms to find a way out, running again to the border or bribing your way out of military service. Here, too, oddly enough for a dictator, Putin is accommodating. He recognizes that any attempt to close off these individualized routes out of peril for Russian citizens would only push people out of their individual responses and into collective ones, protest, mobilization, exactly the sort of thing that he would prefer to avoid. And so Putin knows that he cannot build a political project that is predicated on deep and complex compliance. He can only build a project that rests on simple and in many cases largely symbolic acts of participation and a minimum of sacrifice. He knows not to demand of people more than they are prepared to give. Now Putin's attempts to gain external followers follow broadly I think the same patterns. When we look around the world we see that Putin has attempted and in many cases succeeded at finding allies among governments and elites, among challengers to governments, uh, and among uh, ordinary citizens um, in states both in the West uh, and in the global middle ground. Now, in doing this, he modulates Russia's message to become compatible with the domestic narratives in the countries where he is seeking influence. He meets his foreign allies where they are, much as he does his Russian followers. Similarly, he does not request that his foreign allies change their agendas and indeed finds ways to benefit from the journeys that they are already on. I'll refrain from naming some of these people uh, that we see particularly in the European space, but we all, I think, know who we are, uh, are, are referring to. And he does not demand of his foreign followers maximalist goals. He makes do with good enough, as long as it pokes holes in the edifice of Western power. He does not necessarily need it to erect a new edifice of Russian power. In fact, it's on that last point where I think Putin's approach to generating followership differs so starkly from the followership doctrine uh, discussed at this conference. Putin rarely, if ever, seeks to mobilize his own followers, whether domestic or foreign, to the achievement of an overly ambitious and as ambitious as his war in Ukraine might seem. Rather, he modulates his ends until, um, sorry, 
he modulates his ends until they can be built upon the ends that his followers are already seeking. And he convinces them that by getting on with their daily lives, they are taking part in something greater than themselves. His focus is squarely on his own power and on whatever preserves and extends it. And anything that serves those purposes is, broadly speaking, good enough. I'll end it there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Just before we head to another short break, uh, just to remind people, the units and organisations out there who might be looking to use the panel session period, there are activity packs on fellowship for use today or in the future for any organisations or on the website in the conference pack. For those in the room, we're breaking now until 14.50. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us all the way through. Um, got a very exciting panel of discussion coming up for you. My name's Ash Bardwaj. I'm a journalist and broadcaster, and I'm also the host of Human Advantage, which is the Centre for Army Leadership's podcast about junior, tactical, and applied leadership. Um, my background is I'm uh, an Army Reserve officer. I'm a captain with the Rifles. Uh, but as a journalist and broadcaster, I've travelled through the regions we're going to be talking about today. I spent six months traveling along the Russia-European border in 2018 to look at Russian information operations effectively in that part of the world. And I then went on to do a master's in King's College London in strategic communications. I started in 2021, and then obviously the large-scale invasion in February 22 happened whilst I was there. So I've looked at it from those perspectives, very much from an information operations and strategic comms perspective. And it was wonderful to hear Oli and Sam share their thoughts about the way the two leaders have approached this in engaging in followership. The way this panel discussion is going to happen this afternoon is next, I'm going to introduce the two speakers. Uh, they're going to give a response and their thoughts about what's been going on and what their understanding is of followership and communications in Russia and Ukraine. And then we'll have a panel discussion. The Slido QR code is up. So use that. Send questions on Slido. I have my phone here, not to WhatsApp friends at home, but to read your Slido questions and then ask them to the audience. So the two speakers we have, first we're going to have John Foreman, CBE. John is an expert in Russian and Ukrainian affairs. He was a Royal Navy officer. He commanded two ships and served on several operations afloat. And he was then the defense attache to Moscow in 2008 to 2011. Right. Oh, uh, Kiev first. My apologies. <laughs> Kiev in 2008. Yeah, in 2008, yeah, 2011. Shots of challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then to Kiev in 2019 to 2022. Uh, John also served in NATO headquarters in Europe, and he also worked within the European Union's defence organisation in a challenging time, which was after the United Kingdom had voted to leave the European Union, but before we'd actually left. So John will be talking shortly. And Major Levson Wood. So Lev is a documentary filmmaker and he's an author of 11 books. Doesn't look old enough to have written 11 books. Um, but Lev's background is through his travels. He has visited this part of the world several times. At the age of 19, he backpacked through Russia on his way to India. And actually, just this Sunday, he returned from Ukraine. He'd been in Kherson and Donbass doing a project about conservation. Uh, Lev's a major in the Army Reserve now, but he was originally as a regular officer in 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment. So Lev will be showing us thoughts too. John. Right. Okay, so I'm very aware I'm in the belly of the beast, the Army, the National Army Museum, taught by the Centre for Army Leadership, obviously I was in the Navy 40 years, left in January, I'm enjoying my retirement, I highly recommend it, but you get there. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute to discussions uh, today. And uh, following Olga and Sam's excellent presentations, not easy. So I thought I'd focus my brief remarks on the Russian military. The Russian military can have moral components. And uh, these guys in the field, who I'm sure you imagine, um, will agree with me, not as smart as guardsmen. I think over the last 18 months, there's been far too much focus on equipment and not enough about the human dimension to Russia's wicked war in Ukraine. Because it's easy to count tangibles, such as tanks, aircraft, artillery pieces, rounds, and actually assess morale, quality of training, and the will to fight. We saw that in all the all the 
Thank you. Or the uh, misassessments before the Wolf War invasion that Russia won't invade, or uh, it'll be over in three days, or Ukraine will sweep through in the invasion, in the uh, offensive. So the lack of focus on the moral component has led to some pretty ropey assessments. So now amid renewed hype about AI and hypersonics and drones, or managed magic bullets to Ukraine's offensive, such as Challenger 2, attack homes, and F-16s, I agree with John Boyd's uh, words that humans fight wars. We must get into the minds of humans. That's where battles are won. Now, I was following, you know, I read the doctrine though about fellowship, which is seen, quote, as a noble act of willingly follow a leader shared by, driven by shared values to achieve a common purpose. It's at the heart of mission command. Well, these guys will tell you uh, the lens is different. There's no mission command in the Russian armed forces. The maintenance of morale is not a principle of war in the Russian military. There's no center of Russian army leadership. Those below the rank of colonel are paid to act, not think. There's no NCO cadre, as we have to understand it. In fact, steps to create an NCO cadre were reversed over the last 10 years by Shoigu and Gerasimov as part of the tre trend that Sam described towards a mythical Soviet World War II past and also a trend towards conservatism and statism. There's very little modern Russian literature about military leadership. If there is, it's about hagiography and uh, about World War II leaders. And there's absolutely nothing on scholarship whatsoever. And that's the same for public and also military academies. Initiative, as you would understand it, quote, the ability to assess and initiate things independently and critical thinking, which are in the doctrine notes about scholarship, have been emasculated in the Russian military through demands to defer to authority a rigid military education system based on facts and not ideas, and the prioritization of state over, over individual needs. You see that also masks, so these guys aren't masks, but you see a number of times people on parade and they're masked. Why is that? It's to create a unified, unified anonymous blob rather than individuals. So good initiative, the Russian military is deemed as the ability to understand and, not imp and implement orders quickly. Following the letter of any plan is emphasized, not the spirit of the plan. And so as Sam described, there's national climate mistrust. Subordinates in the Russian armed forces have limited freedom, action and thought. Their willingness, in fact, the, quote, the definition to follow is completely disregarded. Followers also distrust each other uh, horizontally. And as we saw in the invasion and since a constructive challenge like I did here, or non-constructive challenge is partially punished. Obedience is rewarded over competence. So, and as my former ambassador wrote recently, Russia today is a country whose moral compass has been smashed to pieces. It's an autocratic dictatorship, Sam said, in which criminality has been incorporated into government. Shared values are aggressive based on consumerism, conformism, and cynicism. And the ideology, I agree with Sam, is obscure, messianic, and near colonial. Yet, despite all this toxicity in the Russia and its army, the terrible morale, the bullying, and the violence, the total disregard for human suffering, and the descent into the moral abyss of war crimes, rapes, and deportations, these Russian soldiers still follow, and they stay in the fight. And if they hadn't done, the Ukrainians would have already won. They'd already be in, in, in uh, rostov on Don. Many Western experts in the pages of newspaper have said that repeatedly over the last 18 months that Russia is ready to break. Russia will break one more push and then pull straight through. Instead, the Ukrainian summer offensive has blunted and has can be seen to have failed. And the Russians have proven willing to take an incredible level of punishment, way beyond, I would say, any punishment a democracy would take in modern time. So why is that? Well, like any army, Russian, the Russian army is a reflection of the society where it comes. And their motivations are also different. Firstly, similar things like duties, motherland, patriotism, religion. The chances in a toxic masculinity world of Russia of proving yourself as a real man, but also fear, indifference, selfishness, and malevolence. I think some Russians quite like killing Ukrainians. And Sam described sort of the general air of compliance in certain parts of the Russian society. It's not the positive, noble scholarship of Western thought and doctrine is rather a scholarship a la Russe. So three quick deductions from me. Firstly, I welcome the focus on the moral components about leadership and scholarship and the central army leadership. Are we investing as, not, as much to understand the Russian moral component as we do to understand the physical component? 
Secondly, I think it's crucial to identify the vulnerabilities resulting from the Russian leadership styles in order to gain operational and tactical advantage. The Rusty have identified human weaknesses such as susceptibility to deception, sticking to COAs for too long, an inability or unwillingness to adapt, an unwillingness to challenge poor decision making, overloaded commanders, late and misunderstood orders. So how can these be exploited as you go forward? And I think lastly, as Russia has deemed our most acute immediate threat and given its leadership fellowship dynamics, should mission command itself adapt to maintain our fighting edge? What is the mission command overhead in terms of time and staff size when confronted with the Russian style and Chinese style armed forces? And is mission command practiced against a realistic Russian Chinese threat during your exercises? Or are you projecting how you think the Russians and Chinese would act based on your own values? So in sum, Boyd also said, people, ideas, machines, and that orders, I agree, and I look forward to your questions. Well, and I thought not to click. I wasn't paying attention. No. Uh, thanks very much, John. That was, that was great. Lev. Uh, thanks, I should probably stay sitting down. So that's all right. <laughs> um, so just um, following on from what John said, I'm, I'm going to start with um, with my experiences in, in Russia very briefly. Um, I was in uh, the Caucasus region back in 2017, um, and I met some Russian Cossack soldiers who'd actually fought in Donbass quite recently. And um, we got chatting and um, they, they asked me if I'd ever served in the military and uh, best not to lie. So I said yes. And they very quickly went off to go and get changed. Um, they wanted to put their uniforms on. They wanted to put their medals on and show off. But I think this is symptomatic of the mentality of of of, of the Russian patriotism in, in the motherland that is that is ever present, and um, it is very much rooted in that Red Army mentality um, that goes back to um, you know, before the the Second World War. Um, but the Second World War it, it plays a, a very key part of the narrative here as well. Um, the, the 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 collective idea that they are repelling Nazis, we, you know, we've seen that in the news, um, and they are they, this is propaganda that they genuinely believe um, that 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 Ukraine is is um, is populated by by Nazism and, and so on, um, and I think this shows that that the need for top down validation that, that you get within the Russian military is not rooted in in mission command, as John said, it's all about the, the uniforms, medals. That's how followership is is generated, and and this goes hand in hand. Uh, with what, what Sam was talking about, the, the limited um, expected compliance, because it's the promise of material gains um, in a very loose um, way, uh, which is obviously, you know, led to things like the looting, stealing of TVs and washing machines. Um, and that that really is is, is a part of and parcel of, of that mentality. It's about acquiring resources and, and the extraction of whatever can be extracted from Ukraine. Um, contrast that to... Um, the Ukrainian mentality, um, and I met this chap um, back in, this was the, the first, no, yeah, the second week of the war, so this was the first week of March um, in, in, in 2022, I, I was over there um, meeting citizen soldiers, you know, this guy was a graphic designer um, just a couple of weeks before, and there he is holding his, um, well, they don't call it, they don't call them Molotov cocktails anymore, they call them Bandera smoothies, so it's, it's sort of moving with the Move, moving with the sign, uh, with the times. Um, you know, Olya talked uh, about Zelensky's style of leadership. There's no medals here, no, no fancy uniforms, um, very simplistic. And, and about his um, humanist approach to leadership, I think that really has permeated down through, um, through society um, and getting citizens to fight for their homeland. And it's very forward looking. Um, Sam talked about how in, in Russia everything is rooted in the past and nothing will, you know, Putin doesn't want things to change. Whereas in Ukraine, it is it's born out of optimism and opportunity. And I think that that filters down to the mindset of, of these citizen soldiers as well. Um, Zelensky's uh, you know, honest style of communication and his visibility at all times, um, again, has engendered trust amongst his followers. Um, and I go, I talk about the sort of the being rooted in optimism and opportunity. Um, it, it, that rebrand, you know, going from Molotov cocktails to to um, Bandera smoothies. Ukraine is is in the process of a rebrand, and I think this this um this is reflected in 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 many of the the styles in which Zelensky has engendered his followership. One of which is humor, 
he's obviously you know a former comedian. And, and that has, um, has sort of been reflected in the way that the, the entire population of Ukraine has sort of rallied together to towards this unified purpose. And has, has everyone's seen this this image before. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but this is this is the um, the, the Russian warship "Go Fuck Yourself" of um, of uh, Snake Island fame, um, which Zelensky approved to be put on a postage stamp. You know, it's it, the, the banter, the, the the sort of comedy element. Um, actually, I think it really does enable Ukrainians to to rally together towards a shared uh, shared purpose, and it's it's that sort of dark military humor that Ukrainians are actually um, are known for, um, and this does help engage with civilians and um, and and unify that 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 um, that mentality to, towards getting the mass support that's required. Um, working on from this, it's it's you know Ukraine is is known for many things, tractor drivers, but I go back to graphic designers. It's a nation of graphic designers. That it's a very creative. Uh, culture and they've mobilized this um in, in many ways i mean this is the latest billboard that you'll see in every city um it's it's the brave ukrainian soldier fighting the orcs and it's i think it's bringing in the uh the use of literature um popular culture uh lord of the rings in this case um which it, which has enabled people to really rally behind this very simplistic narrative of good versus evil um and i think that entrepreneurial and creative mindset has been allowed in the military too we don't do it necessarily do it all the time um in the british army where we allow people to be creative with their ideas but when you know ukraine on a war footing um they, they need to they need to be able to react quickly you know I, i've got a background in, in media ops and, and influence ops we still need to get sign off at many levels in ukraine people are encouraged film it share it get it online win that media war immediately and, and that's been of enormous help uh, and certainly that's where their their advantage lies um you know using memes social media that also helps spread this unified narrative um the final one i'm going to talk about is is the idea of resilience and hope you know ukraine has shown amazing uh phenomenal resilience not just amongst the fighters but the whole civilian population and i think it's it's that ability to bounce back and get back to normal very quickly even even though the, the conflicts the war is ongoing People are forced to just get back. And I, I was in I was in uh, Ukraine uh, just a couple of days ago, and you know, Kiev nightclubs are open, bars are open. People are just getting on with their lives. Soldiers, they they're in the trenches on the Thursday. They go on leave. They they go out and see their mates and, and go clubbing, and then they're back to the front on the Monday. So this this is incredible. I met, I met this guy, Sergey. He um he was a, a civilian with no links to, to the military at all. Uh, back in 2019, he established uh, a national park. It's Ukraine's youngest national park called Kamiansky Sich, um, right on the Dnipro River. And of course, uh, when, when the Russians invaded uh, the second day of the war, he was captured um, along with many of his, his colleagues who were working as rangers in conservation and in interrogated. He was held in a very small cell, tortured. Um, because on his ID card, it said um, the, the director of national parks and the Russians who found the ID card thought it said director of Nazis. And that was that was the sort of mentality. So, um, you know, they, they thought he was a Nazi. They told him to go outside and dig his own grave uh, whilst they were drinking vodka. Thankfully, when their backs were turned, he, he managed to escape. He swam across the Dnipro River. Uh, this is in February, bear, bear in mind, and uh, two miles across the Dnipro River. Um, and managed to survive, whereas his uh, his colleagues were were all killed. So absolute heroism. Um, what did he do? Literally, the, the day the day that he he swam across the river, he went and joined the Ukrainian army to, to where he's serving to this day. And then in his spare time, he's still out there saving trees, digging up landmines, and protecting national parks. Thank Thanks very much. So I think I'll start with like a big question that I imagine most of you are probably thinking at this moment. Given that Ukrainians seem to be following an excellent model of leadership and followership, equal partnership around a shared purpose, mutual trust, responsible challenge, and common values, and the Russians are doing very much the opposite, how is it? That the Russians are still in the field and Ukraine hasn't achieved the military success that we all expected them to have. In which case, is there any point in following all of this stuff, or should we just follow the Russian model? Sam. Mm. 
Um, well, there's probably a couple of of um, of partially answers to that question, right? Um, one of which is that while I, and I'm not a military expert by any means, right? But while I take the point that, that people fight wars, they do fight wars with equipment, too. Um, and equipment matters, right? Um, as do quantities of people, um, as do the decisions about um, how to deploy the people you have and the cost benefit analysis that will feature into that. So those differences are are there, they're real, and I think it would be foolish to ally to them entirely. Um, but um, I, I might take issue with a little bit of the characterization of followership in Russia, right? um, which is to say that um, while Putin is not able to motivate the entirety of the Russian population to be on the front and to be committed to the fight, um, first of all, he wouldn't be able to mobilize many more people simply logistically than he already has on the front lines. And we've seen that as an issue. So there's organizational issues as well, but he has enough. Uh, and he has enough commitment from uh, from those people who are there um, that, um, you know, while we can, from our perspective, see the failing logic of that commitment and see the, um, the, the false trade-offs that people are, are making, um, they, that, that logic looks failing and seems false to us in ways that it does not to the people who are caught up in it. Uh, so I think that, that we, it would be a mistake to, to say that, um, uh, that in fact, the, 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 there is, that there is no morale. I, I think I would agree with, with, with John on this, that the reality is that the people who are in the fight are committed to the fight, maybe for reasons we don't like or don't understand. Um, and there are limits to that commitment, but it is good enough for Russia to get what it wants out of this war, which at this point fundamentally is is not to lose. Well, do you think that there is almost better followership with Ukraine, therefore they're doing more with what they have, that Russia is able to do more, even though it's doing less good with what it does have? Yes, I think it's the answer to that. Is, is, is Ukraine doing more with less? Yeah. And is Russia of doing less? Of Ukraine more? is doing more with, with less. I mean, everyone in this room understands that Ukraine is doing more with a great deal less. And is followership right? the key to that? And it, it, it's, it's, it's a major element of it. But I want to continue on from what Sam was saying. Uh, it's very interesting that now we're talking about, you know, good enough not to lose is the conversation. In February, February 16th, 2022, when my survey was in the field, we were talking about three days, two weeks to complete occupation of Ukraine. And many people in this room who are strategists and many military folks around the world thought that this was indeed possible. So I think what we need to understand, followership is a major element, and I'll get to that in one second, but certainly Ukraine did not have the equipment and it's a miracle what happened in those first few weeks, quite frankly. And if it wasn't for reforms in the military that started around 2016 were under Poroshenko were continued, of course, the, the opposite of the reforms that were happening in, in Russia, uh, the decentralization of military uh, organization also, the decentralization of political power in Ukraine, all these things had a huge impact both on military structure and the way that the country was being um, organized and, and the operations of the state itself. And that is, is really important. On top of this, everyone forgets that folks, who, who did Zelensky bring on to the Euro-Atlanticist, pro-democracy, engaged side. It was people that were predominantly Russian speakers, people that were in the Southeast of the country, who up until around 2020 did not see themselves as part of this central civic identity thing that is so important in Ukraine. They became the front lines, right? They were the first to mobilize. Actually, largest mobilization numbers initially come from these regions, both first in 2014 and then later in 2022. So that is the followership, that did work. That is why Russia is now trying not to lose instead of to win and take it all. And so that was partly by bringing those people in. I can't remember who talked about it earlier, but giving the person who might have been the cynical follower, giving them the opportunity to be part of the solution and they, they can become star followers. Integral part. They feel like they are doing the key job, right? 
Um, John, you must have been seeing this transition um, in the Ukraine military from its performance in 2014 through to 2022 when you were doing some of the roles that you were at NATO and so yeah. on, not as a military attaché at the time, sorry, defence attaché. Um, do you think that has been vital in Ukraine's ability to <laughs> nullify Russia's ability to win? Sam mentioned earlier on how Putin seems to alter his ends to match what the audience's ends are at that time, um, which gives him some flexibility. Mm -hmm. But for you, that that ability to win, did you see that change from 2014 to well, 2016? I think it showed, although there was some more of military reform in 2016, as yeah. you said, I would say we were at this from the 1990s and 2000s with the help of various you know, um, visiting parties, the NATO and the British Army, whatever. You know, because we wanted to do two things. Firstly, was to place the uh, Ukraine military under democratic control, unlike you know the sort of old style Soviet model of a general like a Shoigu, and the second was to incul inculcate the sense of leadership, uh, responsibility taking, uh, mission command. Uh, although we recognised there was the problem was there was a dead weight of the old Soviet style general staff. So my you know, assessment in twenty. 2008 was to stop training and stop doing anything with senior officers, generals, shift the focus to majors, lieutenant colonels, sergeants, one of warrant officers, part of emerging NCO cadre, so that in 10 years' time, he says, presently, there'd be a better place to do still things we're discussing right. about. Now, having said that, obviously things accelerated after 2014 and even did Orbital, which I think is a you know, fantastic program. But it hasn't, I think, completely changed the Ukrainian armed forces, which we say to a Western model. I think we've got, quote, a hybrid model. I don't want to use that word here, but a hybrid model with some sort of pockets of the Soviet style, the leadership, especially parts, some parts of the army. But married with all the sort of innovative, agile people we're seeing, gone to Western training, we've done things Ukraine, we've done stuff in BMAT in Czech Republic, we've gone through the system. We've done Western forces have been at exposure to speak the language much more modern who for whom the Soviet Union is a, a distant uh, it's not memory at all, they've been born after that generation. So yes, yeah. it has helped them, I think, uh certainly in the days around Kiev early on in February, which I think was a, a miracle. Um, given all the sort of weight the Russians threw the problem. I think that the problem is it's not just about soldiers' valor and courage and sort of fights and mateship and good NCOs and good leaders. It's also about an organization with the armed forces acting as a cohesive whole at the operational and strategic level. I think that's where the weakness is. Thank you. Oh, sorry for the long answer. Right. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, Lev, you, you, you were in Ukraine, in Kiev, just a month after <laughs> the full-scale invasion started in 2018, and you've been there recently now to Kherson and Donbass, where yeah. fighting is still happening. Yeah. Had you seen a change in either the morale um, or, or shared objectives of the soldiers that you met on the ground? And how did you see the communications to develop that from the leadership changing over that time? Or did it? I mean, you've shown, the, you've shown us the images just there of the posters. Sure. Um, it, it, the communication element happened very quickly, um, in, in my experience. The I, I was there, as I say, second to the, the fourth week um of the um of the war and you know we even after that seven day period there were people volunteering um in, in huge numbers um into the volunteer sort of the militias and so on um it, it didn't take long before the militias um were, were sort of circumventing whatever deficiencies they had in, in things like funding crowdfunding campaigns were set up by individual units to raise money to get kits um, so it, it happened very quickly, and I think it, it goes back um, to what Olya was saying about the, this this idea of uh, you know it being a nation of activists and protesters, in that people were, are very um, quick to respond to a crisis, um, and, and they did, and, and you know we we see that as very heroic and um, and noble, but I think it's also just uh, deeply rooted in, in in the way that the Ukrainian psyche uh, operates. I would suggest. And so this is touching on that point that we've had covered in a couple of the lectures and the discussions of leaders becoming followers. And you touched on this uh, in your in your uh, talk earlier on, Olivia. And I think that's what you're highlighting there. Like the mayors, everybody took on a responsibility that they had to do something. 
And although Ukraine ha doesn't currently have strategic success, it hasn't won, it has prevented what everyone presumed would have happened. Well, for Ukraine, it's 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 an existential threat. Yeah. And so there, there is an element that you, you could argue say, well, you've got to, otherwise you just you, you have to succumb uh, to the invader. And that, that's just not a not really um an option for, for, for the vast majority of people in Ukraine. Certainly ones I, I met that you know allowing Russia to occupy their homeland um it, it was was never really on the cards. And and I think going back to your question of why is Russia still there? Well, actually, where they are is in the Russian-speaking heartlands, and that make I think that makes the difference. Do you think? What What do you think, Olya, on on that? Um, how How would it make a difference? Well, to clarify because I don't agree. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so clarification first, and then I can say no. <laughs> okay. So certainly, from the people that I met, in terms of my you know the guys that I was with, I mean, both soldiers and civilians. Um, there was a sense that the people in certainly the eastern parts of the Donbass were, I'm not saying suggesting that they are in any way happy with the Russian invasion, but they're perhaps less willing to join in with the national um, resistance. Times. I'm not sure the data really pans out that way. So people, uh, I think people also need to, they, let's face it, you, you said yourself, there are questions about morale at the front, right? Mm -hmm. People are entering another very difficult winter time period, and they have to find explanations for what they're feeling, right? Which is a lack of success. But I think it's not really a lack of success. It's the inability to do certain things without attack and inability to do certain things without something else. And I think those who are uh, leading the way understand that, right? Uh, but when you're having conversations, you have to, there's a psychological, it's a psychological tool to prepare yourself. You have to find reasons for why you hit an obstacle. Um, but the data on, on the people living in occupied territories doesn't actually pan out to be like this at all. Um, we have an issue about falsified preferences right now in occupied territories. We have an issue of people's threat perception and really their ability to survive if they say otherwise. But there are other ways that we're trying to get at their 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 opinions and views and, and some that Stratcom in, in Ukraine are working on, so I won't be talking about it too much today, but also social scientists are trying to get at better views of people in occupied territories. And we have a partisan armed resistance movement in occupied territories that is actually a lot larger than most people understand, that is growing in size uh, and has direct communication with the Ukrainian army. And uh, that uh, actually started in the very first days and then has continued to grow and expand and people have been tracking this specifically. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure that that pans out exactly how you say. Uh, I do think that there is going to be a portion of the population who either for survival or just to get on with life, they will not want to engage, fight, fight back, what it may be. But I don't think that's the majority. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> on the international leadership point that um, you touched on earlier on, Sam, is that the case of the West will follow Zelensky, or, or or is or is the or is the West following Ukraine? Does the West want to support Ukraine, or is it only because Zelensky is there? How significant is that kind of followership to the sustainment for Ukraine and its war effort? Do you think? And John, I think it depends on which part of the West we're talking about. Um, I spent way too much time than is healthy in Washington. Um, and I think in Washington, it is much more a case of following Zelensky uh, than it is of following Ukraine, although I don't want to say that following Ukraine is, is absent, right? There are um, the, the depth of, or I'm mindful of the fact there's thousands of people watching this. The depth of strategic commitment from Washington, I don't think I'm breaking any news to anybody, um, is less solid than it is in some other NATO capitals, including this one. Um, partly because the breadth of the cross-party commitment in Washington is much more tenuous, to not, not to say almost non-existent at this point. Um, there are those certainly within the American foreign policy community, including the political community, who are committed to Ukraine for a moral reason. There are those who are committed to Ukraine for a um, uh, for a national security and the U.S. national interest reason. 
Um, but there is a disturbing number who are making these decisions evidently based on uh, a, a political and transactional logic. In other words, whether or not they think it sells domestically uh, or with key audiences. Um, and so they are looking at um, the uh, looking at the fortunes on the battlefield. They are looking at how uh, opinion polling in the U.S. responds to the fortunes on the battlefield, or at least how they interpret those responses, which I think is problematic. They are looking at the um, uh, articles that people like Zeluzny write in, in in various places, and 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 they are manipulating this for their own political purposes, right? But it is there, right, that I think, and in some other places, probably uh, around Europe as well, that. Um, uh, it is very important that Zelensky continues to play the role that he has played. There are other places, including, I think, in London, where it's somewhat less important in, in, in Warsaw, yeah. in the Baltic capitals, uh, where the, the sense of, of intrinsic national interest is much clearer. Uh, but I don't think we can treat Western support as monolithically unproblematic. And is, is this a vulnerability in the leadership followership model? John, I'd love to hear about your thoughts about vulnerabilities of the Russian followership model. And is this a challenge for Ukraine in that so much is invested in Zelensky? John, and then I'll come to you. I agree with Sam. I think um, on the day of the invasion, I was watching Boris Johnson in the House of Commons when he made a speech to the nation and he went to the debate. The way he framed it wasn't about Zelensky. It was about the values, it was about the sheer struggle against tyranny and, and the fascism, dictatorship that Putin was a blood, blood so dictator, quote unquote. And I think it was wise rather than trying to over personalize it because we know that um, Russians' target is indeed Zelensky. And it's one of the sense of gravity for morale, the attack, take out, murder, as Zelensky said. Um, if it's murdered by the Russians, then that's going to have a pretty significant effect. On Ukrainian morale, which is also the center of to keep on fighting. So, I think not personalizing it is um, important. The second thing I'd say is Zelensky's appeal and the Ukrainian case is less attractive outside the West. And there's a much degree bat battle of ideas there. And in that space, as Sam said, I think Putin is more successful because he doesn't demand messy things about laws and democracy and freedoms and values. It'll be much more transactional. Thank you. Olive, are you Thoughts on that? And, and does that, in relation to um, what John just finished with saying then, will that mean that they'll just, Ukraine needs to write off certain countries to deal with internationally, or is that changing? Oh, not at all. So first off, Ukrainians love Boris, which when I tell my students this, some of them are surprised. In fact, when we ask the question, who should be the next president of Ukraine, uh, <laughs> Boris Johnson got 1.5% of the civilian population. So we might be doing a little bit better in Ukraine than here. But uh, that is important because the first thing you said is in the West. And then who are we talking about? We went straight to very particular politicians, uh, leaders, and so on and so forth. And I think, Sam, you started to allude to the general population of the United States, but also the United Kingdom and across Western Europe and elsewhere. Uh, then the conversation is a little bit different. And what is interesting there is that Zelensky might appeal to a lot of people for a variety of reasons, but Zelensky has been very careful in his communication to uh, Westerners, um, both elites and ordinary citizens, in not talking about I and himself. Take a look at his speeches. We write about that in the book, actually. He talks about we, and then he always gives vignettes about ordinary citizen experiences. He understands that it's the ordinary plight of ordinary Ukrainians that is going to be most efficacious in both bringing on uh, elite actors and also the person watching telly at home. And in, in the US, when you ask these questions in very particular way on surveys, the Republicans, when you frame this as a fight between good and evil and the Ukrainians, the ordinary Ukrainians on the side of good, the Republicans start supporting Ukraine at greater numbers. So there's actually a very interesting communication strategy that could be employed just in and Razom, an organization that, that I've had the pleasure to uh, get to know a little bit better in the States is doing exactly this. Um, but when it comes to beyond this, so first of all, Zelensky is very careful not to make himself the only possible leader uh, base. So there's a lot of people that come into prominence and uh, the, the strategic, uh, strategic uh, things that Zaluzhny says in public 
And these articles are done on purpose because actually even in Ukraine, Zaluzhny, General Zaluzhny has a certain core um, group of supporters. And to show that there, you can't take just one out. It's not the end if you just take Zelensky out. It will obviously affect morale, I'm certain, but there are more leaders, both political and military, that can step in. So when you develop followership to the extent that the followers have their own momentum towards that shared purpose and the leader can... Yeah, absolutely. And if I can just uh, speak about um, the tactics in, in the Global South, um, which is what everyone's thinking when they're thinking about the rest of the world. This has been a, a, also a strategic communication tactic the past year and a half. There have been teams deployed to South Africa. There have been teams deployed to India. There have been teams deployed to Buenos Aires and to Rio in just to communicate to these groups of politicians and ordinary citizens. And when Ukrainians are doing this, they are framing the conversation as Russia is our imperial hegemon. You might know a different history there. In, in, in your country, it might be someone else. It, for us, this is what it is. And that actually has shown, again, to work very well. We have a variety of global surveys that show that ordinary civilian populations in places like South Africa, in places like Argentina, actually move in greater support for um, Ukraine. Uh, and that's interesting development. So, so developing strategic followership as a high level followership on an international scale, the very specific and targeted and thought through communications and messaging. We've heard a few people talking today about the importance of authenticity and humour in generating followership. And um, I think many of us in, within this room will know that it's something that seems to be fairly common in the culture of the British Army. Um, Lev, you talked about Zelensky's use of humour. Where do you see us being able to use it in the British Army differently? And perhaps as a way to, again, with the analogy with Ukraine, we talked about their abilities graphic designers and our hmm. challenge in sign off. How can we use that mix of humor to deliver effect? And how do you think we can unleash the potential of leadership and scholarship in the army? It's a good one. Um, we're, we're not faced with the same set of challenges, of course. So it's, you, you can't necessarily simply unleash as much as one might want to as a, as a military commander, and nor, nor, nor should you, because I think that um, there are, other things to consider politically and, and so on. Um, so I think uh, and, until you're faced with an existential threat, like you were in the Second World War, the First World War, then you can then you can start making politically incorrect memes about the enemy. I think until that point, um, I, I think it's unwise to to do so. But I think it's absolutely well within Ukraine's um, remit to to be to be creating followership through this establishment of, of, of a shared uh, value system. Uh, and mm. I think that's 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 a very wise move. And I suppose that's one area where authenticity and humour are, are are vital to this. If you think back to the models we saw earlier on, shared values were critical to it. And I mm. guess humour is a way to indicate shared values and develop authenticity. Yeah, of course, yeah. I'm going to stick with you for a moment, Lev. Outside of the military, a lot of your work involves generating and then going on these expeditions and filming projects. Mm. And you're having to create teams from scratch often, because people are unavailable for those trips. How do you switch between the role of leader and follower in those things? And how do you engender followership in the people that you're leading? So it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, the kind of projects that I work on, whether it's an exhibition or, or a film, um, they're, they're usually, nine times out of 10, my ideas that are, you know, that, that I've come up with this, this sort of plan to go and, do something and then I have to put the team together but then at some point I have to become a, a follower because I'm not the creative expert so to speak I'm not a director um so I have to bring in subject matter experts who then ultimately make decisions about what I do and sometimes what I say and so you know for example when I was in Ukraine last week um you know I, I managed to muster muster my team brought on a director um, to, to film the project. And then ultimately he's the one who signs off on who we speak to, what the narrative is, and, and ultimately what the purpose of, of the um, of the shoot in this case is. Um, and I have to respect his creative lead on that. Uh, and and you, it's, just, it's very simple. You just take your ego out of it and put your trust in somebody else's levels of expertise. And I think that that can be just as applicable in the military as it can in, in, in the civilian world. So it's not like using subject matter experts and giving them an element of mission command yeah. and then 
don't think it's authority that, and responsibility that, that so much. engenders trust it gets people more bought into the projects and if people know that you're going to work in that way then they will respect you more as a, as, a, as a you know as a fellow teammate um and a follower which works both ways and i think that then that gets the best out of them because that they can sort of relax into their yeah. role and i can yeah. relax into mine and and sometimes i have to check myself and and, and just zip it and, and that's fine and i think you know we, we can all learn from that and i think it's it's going much communication it's about asking the question even if you already know the answer yeah and I think that, that that's something we definitely can do in the military as, as leaders, as commanders. It's like, you probably know that you're going to go straight up the middle, but you still have to, it's, it's worthwhile speaking to your team, speaking to your subordinates and saying, what do you think? You know, what would you do? Um, and then if somebody says, well, I go straight up the middle, let them take the credit for that because you don't need to take the credit as a commander. You're already in a position of authority. Um, it's sometimes worth just spreading the love a bit. Thank you. Uh, speaking of spreading love, John. Um, we've <laughs> we've heard about the different ways that Putin and Zelensky approach leadership. What would you think are the three sustains and three rejects that you would take from each of their leadership styles and their ways of building policy that we could apply here? What do you think we should take from Zelensky and not emulate from the same principles? Well, I agree. That point about humour, I think, and. Um, way Zelensky uses humour um, and openness to communicate. I think one, I think two has been that sort of every man ap appeal to him you know, that he's been seen in comparison to some previous Ukrainian leaders have been slightly more remote. And I, one of the things that always struck me is how Zelensky goes and sees the soldiers at the front line and he goes and sees the families of the bereaved and he goes to the hospitals. I mean, they're Putin, I've seen Putin's reaction in a hospital, he's confronted with soldiers and people. This is a very sort of formulaic. Maybe the others are saying that this guys can't do it. They have no empathy. So I think that shows that, that his ability, his emotional intelligence, is, is empathise. And I think back to that question about values, um, you know, projecting values, showing that what it's about, not just internally in Ukraine and uh, even inside, you know, internationally as well. Any other one? Uh, are there three things that we we wouldn't use in our Well, I mean, as I just wrote down about the pressure and laughter is, um, you know, the Russian MOD is not a barrel of laughs because of that. <laughs> you know, if you go there, it's like, it's pretty formal, pretty structured. I mean, that it was like stepping back into the armed forces when I, when I joined you know, <laughs> 30, 40 years ago. Very much more rigid, you know, you can do this, All officers are officers. Uh, so sailors and sailors are never going to mate. So I thought that you know I took away uh, the, the sort of the old top heaviness of it. So you know when I we used to go and see Gerasimov once a year for an audience, the bus routine, the bus routine, the mini bus routine, is being run by Lieutenant Colonels and Colonels. Not even the so, no, It's just unbelievable. We went to the artillery school, and I've never seen so many colonels in one place. Well, apart from the guards, you know. But there's so many. Uh, <laughs> there's so many guards. I mean, there was so many colonels all hanging around. So I think you know decentralization, improvement, trust, delegation, all the things we've sort of inculcated. Uh, although noting as, as demand, sometimes you know directness is required when confronted by the enemy. A lot of time for debate. I mean, one of the other questions, points I made earlier about character versus sticks, you know, we haven't really spoken about punishment battalions or barrier troops, military police, military political education. That's all brought about because officers don't trust the men, and they are men, um, not in the same way as we do. So, sustain and improve whatever trust. Sam, do you think that there are any things that we can see that Putin has done well that might be applicable in our society, in our forms of leadership? Or is that very specific to that society? Is it a case of the followership model is specific to the diff two different societies? Well, so I think the content of the followership appeal that Putin builds is specific to Russia. Right? It is built out of the experiences of Russian citizens over decades. Um, which isn't to say that there aren't some experiences that aren't cognate with experiences that we might find in our own societies, but broadly it's a different, it's a different edifice. However, I think that, um, you know, Putin, and I did not 
tend to come here identifying things that we might emulate from, from Putin's approach. But, you know, I, I think Putin has a, a clarity of mission and purpose from his own perspective, right, which allows him to make decisions about what is needed and what is nice to have, but maybe not absolutely necessary, unless he has some clarity over where he can make sacrifices um, and, and where and how he can make trade-offs. Um, and I think it is, you know, uh, important that he um, does, again, meet people where he where he finds them, uh, where they are, um, and he limits what he uh, asks of them, um, such that his demand on people is based on on their view of the world of, uh, more maybe than, than than his view of the world. It sounds odd to say to think of Putin as this sort of empathetic leader, right? But um, to a certain extent, right? Again, it, it imposes very real limitations, right? Um, it does not create a sense of real citizenship. This is not a constituency in, in, in Putin's projects in uh, in any way. And there are very real consequences for stepping out of line, right? Um, but one, as long as you are in line, he makes sure that there are not a lot of reasons for you to want to step out of line. Um, and I think that there are, particularly when we think about our relations with, with the global middle ground, the, the global south, um, uh, there is something to be learned uh, uh, in there. Right? I'm not suggesting that Western governments engage with uh, governments in the global south uh, with the degree of of um, omnivorousness and and um, pragmatic transactionalism that Russia or or even China undertake. Right? Um, but to have a clearer understanding of where people are, why they see the world the way they see it. Uh, and thus how we need to engage with them to get what is also for us good enough rather than necessarily always the perfect, um, I think is, is is a lesson maybe that's, that's worth taking. So understanding people's hopes, fears, grievances, dreams. And yeah. I think that's what we can also do on a personal level. So you've talked there clearly about the global South. But I'd love to get your insight into how we as in the army as leaders at the per personal, junior, and tactical level, <coughs> and use some of the abilities that Zelensky has. You know, you've talked about his history, his innate competency as a communicator and a leader that engenders followership. Are there any, I guess, TTPs, techni techniques, tactics, and protocols, <coughs> and procedures that we could use to lead and engender followership like Zelensky does at the lower level? Well, I think yes, and certainly, all as I said, all the mayors and local council heads have done exactly this. They've tried to emulate substance and, and, and style, but style needs to work for you. So great to talk about humor as a potential tool, but if you're not a particular funny person <laughs> and you can't deliver a line, it is going to backfire in a very horrible way. <laughs> Similarly, this uh, every man sort of ness and wearing the the, gr the green uh, jumper t-shirt. That's not something new. That's not, that did not start in 2022. Ever since 2014, when he's been visiting army bases, which he was doing privately and professionally, putting on concerts, uh, he, he, he dressed down in a certain way and he had a certain look about him. Since president, he wore a green t-shirt, right? It works for him because it's authentic. So if you're not funny and you don't look great in a t-shirt, <laughs> try something else. No, but seriously, because those those techniques and tactics go only as far as they are convincing and authentic to the to the people that they're supposed to be engaging with. But I think most importantly, that image, um, that was not about humor. Ukrainians turned it into humor. It was a soldier being, as you might know the story, I'm sure most of you do, a so soldier being told to 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 surrender. This is the stamp image that we're showing yeah, the earlier. Image, the sorry. Ukrainian flag. Yeah. The, um, a, so, a, a soldier on Snake Island being told to surrender and them responding, uh, as was already said, in Russian. That's the important note there. And because it was authentic to that individual to respond in Russian, not simply respond to Russians in Russian, but they were also a, a Russian speaker. And they clearly responded, it was an existential threat for that individual, right? And 
that's why it worked because it was the exemplar moment of Ukrainian civic national identity and statehood attachment of a Russian speaker who is not a high ranking individual doing what Zelensky then does, right? So it's this, this leaning into who you are truly to lead, I think it makes you a better leader. Uh, and to, and then and followers do the same. And you have to give space for your followers to be different from you uh, in that same way. And if you look at Zelensky's team, you do have a rag team of very different approaches. Some people like their sweaters. Um, if you look at Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, some people like their Navy suits and some people like their sneakers. There's not, now we're all going to be looking like Zelensky and acting like Zelensky and using the same tactics, same communication techniques and so on, because it is not authentic and does not work for them. Thank you. Uh, Lev, right at the beginning, General Zach was talking about uh, how the Lance Corporal to Captain level was critical for Mission Command. That's where it really happened. Mm -hmm. We've just been talking about authenticity through style and substance in leadership generating followership. When you look at what you've learned both in your civilian life and reflecting back on your military life, what do you think have been ways that you found good to generate that authenticity? How, how did you do it as back when you were platoon commander? Mm. And how do you do it now to build that rapport? And can you build authenticity or? Um, <laughs> I think you can build authenticity because I think that authenticity as a person is one thing, but it's authenticity within a role is 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 a slightly different thing because we all we all need to learn the roles and you know the duties and responsibilities of any role, whether it's <laughs> in the capacity as, as a military commander or or whatever else it might be, and and you sort of have to relax into that role. And I think that that's something that that sense of relaxation um, and and comfort, and I say comfort, um, in a way that 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 really reflects that you are confident in your ability to perform that function. That is authenticity. I think mm. if you're bluffing your case, if you're overly compensating because you haven't done your homework, or um, or you're simply not confident in in your ability to do that job, people pick up on that. And so I think it's just about just being good at what you do or, or, or at least giving it your best shot because people will forgive you if you're not actually um, the best at something. They're not going to forgive you if you're just lazy. So I think really it's just, it's just giving it, giving things your best shot. Can I go in on just, it strikes me as this, as I said, knowing your strengths and weaknesses and knowing your team's strengths and weaknesses. And that allows everyone to be authentic in their specific roles, right? And this takes me to something we were talking about earlier over lunch. Um, in a particular experience of one battalion when they were talking about a strategic thing that they were about to do. And you have to understand, as we know, that the Ukrainian army is now really a civilian army in part, right? And so you had one individual up by who's an architect that happens to be a, a friend of mine. And he just said, no, that won't work, physics. And then they're like, oh, okay. So then we're gonna have to do this other thing. And then they, they said that they need this strength or that strength, or that capacity to lift something. And literally a boxer came by and said, oh, I can do this thing that you're asking about. And they had a very, there was a space in that leadership. There was a, there was a space for these followers to come in with their strength in a very authentic way that only an architect could and a boxer could together. And all I know is that what they did is successful. I don't know the details of what they exactly did, but maybe some of you do. <laughs> so allowing that space to fail, it's, it's giving people the opportunity to learn from mistakes and, and creating a, that, a safe environment for people to practice. Well, I was reflecting, we were talking about psychological safety earlier, and I think Ira talked about the importance of psychological safety. And um, when I, I remember when I took over my platoon in the reserves, one of the things that we did after exercise is I asked each of the section commanders, what are your three sustains and three improves for yourselves? And what are your three sustains and three improves for me as your platoon commander? And that created over time a space of psychological safety, but also self-awareness and self-criticism for them. It then made it easier for all of us to then point out challenge, respectfully challenge or respectfully challenge up when we were conducting exercises and it just made everything work a lot easier. And that made it easier to identify strengths and weaknesses. We're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but do any of you have any burning points you really need to make before we disappear? We can save those for afterwards as we have coffee. 
happiness. Um, so everybody, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel, uh, Sam Green, John Foreman, TBE, Leveson Wood, and William. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ash. If you could just give us 60 seconds to well clear the stage well and then we'll hear from the Army Sergeant Major W. Ronald Paul Carney. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the Army Sergeant Major. Thank you, sir. I um, Well, what a day. I think uh, you'll all agree with me that there aren't many places, certainly in the military, where you could see officer cadets, lance corporals, mixing with professors, doctors and authors, and a couple of generals in there for good measure. Um, so before I go on, I think, because they won't thank themselves, I'd like the audience to uh, please recognise and thank the Cal team for putting this together. So they always give me the last gig, which means I'm furiously taking notes. It might be the uh, the way that they do business to make sure that I am taking those notes and taking on board what's said. But um, followership, I think uh, director leadership summed it up from the start. This isn't something new. We've been doing this for 350 years, but we just maybe haven't codified it. And when I look back, I wonder... And I think uh, when I started reading up on followership and, and knew that we were going to be doing this, and the first thing that came to my mind was um, the command tasks that we do from day one. Day one, be that if you're a young soldier, a young officer, even a cadet. Um, those that don't know, a command task is a enclosed environment, a safe to fail environment where we allow commanders to be able to command a small team on a similarly complex task to see how they, they fare. If I swap that word command with follower, would it be any different? Because those that have done those command tasks will recognize that it's as much on the followers in that team as it is on the commander. There's uh, always a moment on that command task where you're asked to reach out and ask followers if they've done that task before. Can anyone offer any insight on how I deliver this? and how I operate it. And then I'd go on to our training courses where we regularly do what um, Captain Ash has just mentioned. We pull our teams in after a training series and we say, okay, this might feel uncomfortable but against your peers, but what did they do right? That's the easy bit, ah, X, Y, and Z. Now's the horrible bit, the bit that we don't like. What did they do wrong? What could they be better at? And then lastly, We've done over 300 years of pairing our officers with our soldiers. And in, in many other worlds, would you think it right that someone that had done 18 months of training would suddenly go on to command next to someone that's got 10 to 12 years of experience? That, for me, is a good example of followership that we deliver on a day-to-day -day basis. And I thought I'd uh, bring some of the words that have come out. And um, Ira, I was going to borrow you. Hat, but I would have ended up on a whole load of memes. So uh, that's not, not a good look for me. <laughs> um, but what I did expect Ira to do, and, and I think we've heard throughout the whole day, was at some point to spin that cap round and I have on the back of the hat, I'm a leader. There's one for you for the future. <laughs> but, but I think that's important that we are at every single level. We're a leader as well as a follower. And the words I kept hearing, and, and it's really important to me, I talk about it a lot, but it's that importance of challenge. So we talk about the fact, um, and uh, Professor Van Tam mentioned it, societally, we're, we're, we're bred to follow, and um, in, in the military even more so. And what's the challenge that I, I would put to our army first, is what do we do on the first day of basic training? We put instructors out that say, hey, follow me, do as you're told, because this is the biggest change that you're going to have. I'm going to turn you from a civilian into a soldier or an officer. And then when we send them onto the field army, we say, hey, challenge us. I go, no, 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 you've you just done 14 weeks of telling me to be quiet and do as I'm told. And now you want to challenge. So it isn't easy. It can be complex. And it's something that we need to continually push and develop. And that's why I think the codification 
of followership is important. I do think that we um, uh, we need to learn to challenge correctly. It's, it's not right uh, in this room. I've got high achievers, both military and civilians, um, and those that want to do it twice and be reserves and be, uh, be highly competitive in two words. Well, if you're highly competitive and you like to think that you're an exceptional individual, you don't like to be told that you're doing something wrong or that you can do it better. So it can be hard for us to accept, both as leaders. So it's important for us as followers that if we want to challenge, we find the right way to do it, the right place, the right person, and the right environment. Because if one of you was to call me out now, I'd probably get loud and angry. If you took me off to one side and said, hey, Sergeant Major, can we have a bit of a chat about what you were discussing earlier? You've already set me up, I'm ready now. This feels like it's gonna be serious. You're gonna tell me something that I might not wanna hear. And it allows me to get in the position to be able to do that. And I think that's important when we talk about followership and the challenge that we need to do. We need to take risk as well. We need to take that risk to be able to challenge because the followership, the calling out that we talk about isn't just about being successful. It's about being safe. It's about looking after the men and women that we serve with. And so putting your hand up and learning and taking that risk to challenge will only benefit you because we tend to be an organization of good people. And I certainly in this role, even, even after 25 years of, of being quite a challenging character, maybe, um, I, I needed education, I needed development. You go into an executive board and you start calling out three-star officers, you probably need to do that the right way. And, um, but I wasn't pushed aside, I wasn't sidelined. I was developed, I was mentored, I was brought on in the best way to challenge. So we should be looking to learn every day. But the only way we'd do that is if we push that challenge. And then I, I think uh, probably before I go on to my last bit, I just wanted to talk about the values and standards that we talk about and that challenge and the importance of it. We talk about integrity. We talk about our selfless commitment and our moral courage. There is nothing worse than leading an exercise, an operation, or even a conference room knowing that maybe I should have asked that question. Maybe I should have challenged. Maybe I should have been the good follower on that day. And that's why I love the fact that we wrap followership around our values and standards. And by wrapping it around our values and standards and, and having that um, type of uh, followership, I think it helps to build mutual respect in your teams and that mutual respect builds trust. And then in turn helps to shape our culture. So lastly, I'll ask everyone, both in this room and uh, online, what type of follower are you? Are you the cynic, the star, the, uh, the sheep or the yes person? Well, firstly, you need to understand who you are. It's not about where you are now, but it's where you want to be. And that comes, I think, in two ways. Firstly, having that honest conversation with yourself, having that look in, taking those moments as we discussed today and saying, uh, you know, in that situation, I was probably a star, pretty awesome. But on that other day, I, I, I just followed, head was down, I just done what everyone else was done and, and that was probably unacceptable. I could have done more. And then secondly, use the peers, use the people around you. There's a huge group of command sergeant majors over here that like to keep me honest every single day. And I need them to, to so that I can be the best follower that I can be and to support our generals and our soldiers. Um, so as you go away, think about who you are, think about the follower you could be, and then in turn, remembering this is the Centre for Army Leadership, the leader that you want to be. Because lead, uh, followers can do so much, but they still need to be led. They still need to be made better. And I think you as a leader can do all of that. So thank you all for taking the time to come today. My brain is fizzing with so much new information and I hope yours is as well. Thank you. Thank you all for engaging with today's topic and the speakers so vigorously. This is, of course, just the start of the conversation on these sorts of topics. And I just remind you that 
the cal is open to your views do share them with us and help us to make this a continual iteration of getting our followership and therefore our leadership better thank you especially to our speakers our panel hosts and our panel guests for making it a great success talking about the theory the practice and the application of followership in the context of leadership as well both the british army wider industries public sector and in particular in the ukraine thanks also to the national army museum for hosting us in what's a great venue we really do value that relationship and to those out in our various audiences please do continue to amplify the cows research thinking doctrine give us your views it is there as the Army's primary resource to continually improve our leaders and our leadership. And just as a reminder for everyone, everything we do is open source. You can search for it on any search engine. And if you have an interest in how we do it, please do engage with us on our social media platforms. Uh, finally, personally for me, thank you to my team for setting up what's been a very professional uh, and well-run day. Thank you very much.